future of the Gulf Coast region. The chairman, Nick Rahal, just uh, gaveled in. This hearing starting now. Live coverage on C-SPAN 3. newest member of the committee. Ben Ray feels a vacancy created by uh, the departure of our colleague Neil Abercrombie. His seniority on the committee, as determined by the House Democratic Caucus, places him directly after his New Mexico colleague, Martin Heinrich. For better or worse, we now have a New Mexico corner on the committee. All right. This morning, we uh, begin a series of hearings on the Deepwater Horizon incident and its implications for future offshore oil and gas activity in the United States. We are all extremely frustrated by the fact that the well, which continues to hemorrhage possibly tens of thousands of barrels of oil into the Gulf of Mexico each day, has not yet been shut down. The blame game is in full force right now. But I do think it is important to determine whether the deep water horizon is the Wall Street of the ocean, privatizing profit while the public bears the risk. In the coming weeks, administration witnesses and outside experts from across the political spectrum will testify before this committee or its subcommittees about this catastrophic event, the federal government's role, if any, in its causes, and remedial steps that will be necessary to reduce the chance of such a horrific event occurring again. This morning, we will hear from my dear friend, the Secretary of Interior, Ken Salazar, who has dispatched tens of thousands of federal employees into the region. He has met personally with the involved and responsible parties. He has been on the scene numerous occasions himself. As a matter of fact, just came back to Washington to be before us today. And it would seem he is doing all in his power to address this, cat this catastrophe. We also hear today from the Acting Inspector General, Mary Kendall, on the findings of a just released inf inst inf investigation excuse me, which found once again misconduct at Minerals Management Service, this time among the ranks of the inspectors who were supposed to be keeping an eye on, not playing around with, industry operators in the Gulf. To now learn that certain agency personnel allowed industry to fill out their inspection reports in pencil, with MMS inspectors then writing on top of the pencil, in ink prior to turning in their reports is truly reprehensible. As a committee of jurisdiction over oil and gas leasing in the Outer Continental Shelf, it falls to us to review the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the new IG report, and the administration's five-year OCS plan and provide the appropriate context in which to consider the future of offshore leasing in this country. I believe that just as a disaster at the Upper Big Branch Mine on April 5th in my district does not signal the end of all coal mining in the United States. So too, in my opinion, the Deepwater Horizon incident does not signal the end of all offshore oil and gas leasing and production in this country. However, it does raise questions that must be addressed before we can move forward. For example, does the OCS Lands Act provide an adequate structure for regulating energy development? Do MMS regulations provide for adequate protection of the environment and the resources that are held in the public trust? Was the MMS derelict in its implementation of its legal and regulatory responsibilities? How should the MMS be restructured to ensure that we effectively address the flaws in their current system that have led us to this point? These and other equally important questions will be examined and answered over the coming weeks and months. If remedial action is required in law, this committee will dra draft the necessary legislation to ensure that risks inherent in deep water drilling and production are minimized. I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Doc Hastings from Washington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, scheduling this uh, hearing. And I want to welcome uh, all the witnesses that will be appearing before us today. I think it's clear that stopping the leaking well, cleaning up the oil, and responding to the needs of the effective Gulf Coast communities should be the top priority for everybody. And that includes BP, the Department of Interior, the White House, and it certainly includes members of Congress. It has been over a month since oil started leaking into the Gulf of Mexico. 
Each day that the oil continues to leak is a day where frustration increases. Both BP and the Obama administration have a joint and shared duty to do everything within their power to stop this flow of oil. While the main focus must be on addressing the immediate crisis, again, stop the leaking well, tough questions must be asked and those responsible held accountable. The time for full disclosure and honest answers cannot be avoided. This is the first of at least seven hearings by this committee. Hearings are an important part of conducting thorough oversight and investigation. But as important as the hearings are, it is critical that the Obama administration discloses reports and documents to the public and to Congress for their review and scrutiny. A true investigation requires examination of both the causes and responses to the bill. Questions include, what was done improperly in the drilling operation? What was the immediate emergency response of the drilling operators and the government? Was everything that could be done, done immediately and without delay? Were there failures in government oversight and inspections before the explosion? What are the economic impacts on the communities, businesses, and the fishermen? And what are the impacts on wildlife and the environment? We must get to the bottom of all of these questions. We must know what happens so that informed, educated decisions can be made and actions taken. We've got an important job to do. We need to get answers and then fix the failures to prevent another spill to ensure that American-made energy continues to operate in a safe manner, in fact, the safest in the world. And I want to note that uh, credit is due to Secretary Salazar for his statements and the need to understand the economic impacts before lifting the liability caps. The bipartisan demand that BP fully pay for the, for the spill is very, very clear. Just as there are bipartisan support for, redo, re, for increasing uh, the cap, care must be taken, though, to do it right so that American energy production isn't shut down that would result in the loss of tens of thousands of jobs. As tough questions are asked, asked, the action of both the Obama and Bush administrations must be put squarely under the spotlight. Regardless of which party occupied the White House or controlled the Department of Interior, it's vital that we know where failures occurred, or occurred so that the necessary reforms can be instituted. This isn't time for finger pointing. It's time to get all the facts out in the open so changes can be made to prevent similar events in the future. On the matter of MMS, the agency's fundamental failures are well known and have been known for several years. For example, Republicans on the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, led by our colleague from California, Mr. Issa, have conducted multiple investigations into MMS. Key questions that need to be answered are, what did the department do with this information? What was done to correct these failings? And when was that action taken? The Inspector General issued a report yesterday that raised even more questions about the lack of adequate response to known problems. And I do want to note that back in the summer of 2008, gas prices climbed past $4 a gallon. The response from the public was clear. Produce more energy in America. A majority of Americans understand the importance of continued offshore drilling to our economy to our, and to the jobs that they create and to our national security. The unprecedented spill must be met with real reform and stronger safety measures, but also to ensure that we continue to produce oil here in the United States. Turning our back on offshore energy production would be too costly in lost jobs, higher gas prices, and increased dependence on foreign sources from nations that are hostile to our way of life. America needs an all of the above energy plan that obviously includes uh, uh, solar, nuclear, hydro, but does not ignore oil and gas. So Mr. Chairman, thank you again for scheduling this meeting. I look forward to today's testimony and, and uh, opportunity to, of our members to ask questions. Yield back. Thank you, Doc. We'll now proceed with our first witness. As I mentioned in my opening comments, dear friend of myself and many of us on this committee. 
And as we were talking beforehand, the Secretary uh, reminded me that his first appearance before this Committee on Natural Resources as Secretary was to testify on legislation reforming MMS, including elimination of the Royalty and Kind program. He has been back before us a couple of times, and uh, as I said, he has poured everything he has at his uh, disposal into trying to not only cap this well, but to uh, help all the affected parties uh, in uh, Louisiana. So we're on and along our coastlines. We're very happy to welcome you today, Mr. Salazar, the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Interior, and he is accompanied by Assistant Secretary David Haynes, another individual very familiar to us. Mr. Secretary, you may proceed. Thank you uh, very much, Chairman Ray Hall, and uh, thank you, Ranking uh, Member Young, and uh, to all the distinguished members of the committee Hastings. Uh, on both Hastings. sides. Hastings. Sorry, got it right. Hastings. Let me uh, just uh, make a couple of uh, quick points, and then uh, I would be happy to take your, your questions. Uh, first, uh, let me say that from day one, what uh, we have been doing is uh, the United States of, of America is uh, moving forward with what has been a relentless effort to deal with this problem. The uh, effort has been uh, directed by uh, the President to each member of uh, the Cabinet that we do not rest, we do not stop, we do everything within our power to try to deal with the problem both with respect to the oil spill as well as with respect to any of the impacts uh, that will flow from the oil spill. That relentless uh, effort uh, today includes uh, over 20,000 people who are deployed along our coastlines to protect the coastlines. That relentless effort includes over 1,000 uh, ships and vessels that are out there in the oceans uh, trying to clean up the spill. That relentless effort includes uh, the body of scientists that we have in Houston at the command center as we try to bring uh, the soil spill uh, under control. Uh, so the President's direction, which uh, we have carried out from uh, April 20th forward, has been that we will spare no effort uh, to make sure that the people of this country, that the residents of the Gulf Coast uh, are protected, and in addition, that we get to the bottom of the story here, which is to understand exactly what happened so that the facts are known to the American people and the appropriate policy decisions can be, can be made going forward with respect to uh, development uh, of energy in the outer continental shelf. Uh, the response uh, that is underway today in uh, the Gulf of Mexico is the single largest response uh, in the history of the United States of America regarding any oil spill. Now, it is true that there have been many oil spills which have been much larger than what we are seeing today in the Gulf of Mexico in the history of this country with respect to OCS development. But this effort, in terms of the response that we have underway in the Gulf, is the single largest effort in responding to an oil spill in the history of this country. Number Secretary, two, uh, would you yield just a moment, please? Uh, if I might have been patient here for a few minutes, ask those that are standing behind the Secretary to please sit because you are impeding the view of other people, and I would just ask that you respect the rights of everybody that's here. Would you please sit down? Would you please sit down? Thank you. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my, my first point uh, to you and uh, Congressman Hastings and the members of the committee is that this effort is relentless. Uh, it is unprecedented and it will continue uh, forward until uh, we deal with this problem effectively and uh, we have the oil stopped and uh, everything has been done to clean up uh, the damage uh, that may occur from it. The second point I wanted to make uh, to uh, this committee uh, is just a, a quick update. Today is a, a very important day in terms of uh, what is happening uh, in the Gulf. Uh, you, I know, have been watching uh, the newspapers and the television sets uh, with respect to the so-called top kill action, which uh, should take place uh, sometime today. Uh, I have been in Houston uh, four times uh, since uh, April the 20th to oversee and uh, to uh, understand uh, what it is that BP is doing uh, to make sure that uh, they are uh, killing this well and uh, stopping the pollution that is now flowing into the ocean. Uh, we have assembled a group of scientists who have been deployed into Houston. Uh, today, uh, Secretary of Energy uh, Stephen Chu, along with the other experts from the Department of Energy Labs at Sandia, at uh, Livermore, and at Los Alamos, along with Dr. Marcia McNutt, who is uh, the Director of the United States Geological Survey, 
are there monitoring what is happening as key decision points are made. Now, the fervent hope of everyone is that the top kill effort, which uh, should be executed uh, uh, in the coming uh, hours, that that will work. Uh, but there also is a possibility that it will not work. And if it does not work, then there is a plan B to move forward with uh, a cap on the well that hopefully will result in the controlling of the pollution that currently continues to spew uh, out into the Gulf Coast. The bottom line, uh, Mr. Chairman, is that I want to assure you that uh, no effort is being spared on the part of the United States of America to try to bring this problem uh, under control. Uh, third, uh, I want to just make a statement uh, about uh, responsibility here because uh, it is uh, an issue which uh, I know every member of this committee has uh, probably spoken out on since uh, this uh, event began on April the 20th. Uh, the fact is uh, that we should uh, all know that the national laws, uh, which uh, you, many of you have been a part of creating over the last uh, 40 years, have created a uh, system of responsibility here where uh, BP is the responsible party. Uh, it also is a law that sets forth uh, some limitations relative to liability. Uh, Secretary Napolitano, who has uh, been uh, leading this effort and uh, doing a Herculean job in making sure that the Coast Guard and uh, the efforts that she has under her control. And I have had several meetings uh, with uh, BP, uh, and we have confirmation from them that they are not going to hide behind the $75 million liability cap. What they have stated formally to us, and we will hold them accountable, and we believe we have the legal right to do this in any event, that they will be responsible for all costs. That means all response costs to this oil spill, which is their spill. It means all uh, damages will be paid with respect to any impacts on natural resources. It means all costs related to the cleanup, and it means that those who will be affected in the Gulf Coast uh, from an economic point of view will also receive uh, compensation. And so they are not hiding uh, behind uh, the liability cap. Uh, so that I think is something which uh, should provide at least the comfort that uh, the resources are there. When you think about a company that in the last year made, made over $16 billion, uh, I think that they uh, will be good for paying the compensation that is, uh, that is required here. Now, as I say, BP is the responsible party. Uh, BP uh, must take the action that is required by law. And it is our job then as a United States government uh, to make sure that BP does the job that it is required to do by law. And that has been a role which uh, I and Secretary Napolitano and others have been playing over the last uh, uh, 36 or 37 days, making sure that BP lives up to the requirements that it has uh, under the law. Now, as I look ahead, uh, it is also important uh, not only that uh, this uh, problem is fixed, uh, but that this problem uh, never happens again. Uh, I would recognize and believe that every member of this committee uh, would not ever want this kind of problem to ever happen again in the Gulf of Mexico or, in fact, for anywhere else in, in the world. So I want to just, uh, in concluding my remarks here, uh, give you what I think are maybe two keystone uh, lessons that uh, we all ought to be uh, thinking about. The first is that reform uh, in terms of how we deal with uh, the development of our natural resources is essential. Uh, it is a reform agenda which I have been on since uh, the day I came into the Department of Interior. It is a reform which led us to uh, establish new ethics provisions for MMS uh, within 10 days after I became Secretary of Interior. It is the results of the investigations that uh, we have undertaken where people who are doing bad things with MMS are no longer employed at MMS. And it results uh, also in uh, what the Inspector General of the Department will be testifying here later on today about what had been happening with respect to MMS in the days before we took over in this administration. Uh, you will find as you read the report that the issues that are raised in that report are issues that go back to 2005, 2006, 2007, uh, the kinds of, uh, of, uh, of improprieties uh, which I think are reprehensible such as going off to uh, the Peach Bowl in 2005 and having the, uh, the oil companies essentially pay uh, the way for MMS employees, those are absolutely inappropriate behaviors. Uh, I will remind this committee and I will remind uh, the United States that when you read that report, they all refer to a time period that predated this administration. 
and it was focused in on a time where there was a relationship with uh, the oil and gas world where, world, where essentially whatever it is that they wanted, it, it, it is what they got. That day ended when uh, I came in as Secretary of Interior, and uh, we have turned the ship, and uh, we have been making progress, progress which has come, frankly, uh, at the uh, criticism of uh, some members who are in this committee and others. But it is progress on reform that has to be made. Now, having said that, it is not enough to say that we have solved the problems. There are still other things that we have to do, including, Mr. Chairman, as I suggested in this committee, in this chair, I think in September of last year, moving forward to have organic legislation for the agency that has such an important responsibility, an agency that has these two very important missions. First, uh, collecting on average $13 billion a year, over $200 billion since it was first uh, formed by Secretarial Order in the 1980s, should, in my mind, have a robust organic uh, legislative enactment that spells out what the responsibilities of this agency are. And number two, an agency that has a responsibility for developing the oil and gas resources in our oceans, which are the places where we have the most oil and gas energy resources left to discover and to produce, has got to have the kind of robustness that comes with organic legislation. We have it in other agencies in the United States uh, Department of Interior, including our National uh, uh, Park Service, United States Geological Survey, and other agencies. It's time that MMS be given that same kind of platform to be able to do the job that has been assigned to it uh, by the United States of America. The second point uh, that I would make is a, a lesson which uh, is important for all of us to recognize. I think uh, this incident in the Gulf Coast um, uh, underscores the importance of what uh, this committee has worked on now for a long time, and that is that we do need to move to a new energy frontier. Yes, oil and gas will be a part of our energy portfolio. We know that that's going to have to be the case for decades to come. But the work of this committee, uh, the work of uh, President Obama and the Department of Interior and his administration to harness the power of the wind off the Atlantic or the High Plains, the sun off of the deserts of California and the southwest, the geothermal efforts throughout the Rocky Mountain region, uh, all of those efforts are incredibly important as we move forward to grasping a reality of a new energy frontier. And with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I would be happy to take questions. I have uh, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior here with me today, David Hayes. Uh, David has uh, been working on this uh, with the same kind of uh, relentless effort uh, since uh, day one. The day after the explosion uh, on the Deepwater Horizon occurred, it was in the evening uh, at approximately 10 o'clock. Uh, the following day, I dispatched uh, David Hayes uh, without a change of uh, clothes and not even a change of underwear to the Gulf of Mexico because I knew that this was an issue uh, which required the kind of urgency and, and focus uh, that we have been giving it since uh, April the 20th. Uh, and uh, because of his efforts and the efforts of uh, literally thousands of people within the Department of Interior, as well as uh, the, uh, the President, uh, members of the White House, uh, my colleagues on the Cabinet, uh, Secretary Napolitano, uh, uh, the Commandant, uh, Thada Allen, and so many others, uh, I feel confident that, uh, I feel confident and resolute that uh, we are doing uh, everything that can be done, and that uh, in the days ahead, uh, we'll be able to forge the kinds of policies and the kinds of, 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 of changes that adjust to the realities that we find today. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. That was perhaps too much information. But we do uh, appreciate uh, the time that you've taken to be with us today and, and your testimony. You know, on the surface, it appears that this deep water horizon disaster has been a game changer as far as how we manage our offshore energy resources on behalf of the American people. It also appears that with the latest Inspector General report uh, in which you have these alleged improprieties of MMS personnel, that this report has put the MMS in the penalty box indefinitely. Uh, my first question would be to you as, you, as we look to the future of oil and gas leasing, in America. Do you think this disaster has been a game changer as far as managing our offshore energy resources? 
Mr. Uh, Chairman, I think that uh, what this uh, incident brings to light is that uh, the organic legislation uh, which you had been working on for a year, uh, which uh, I testified in support of a year ago, mm -hmm. that it's time to get uh, those kinds of uh, initiatives uh, underway. Uh, we need to make sure that as we move forward with uh, development of uh, oil and gas resources in the outer continental shelf, that it is being done in a safe way and that uh, this kind of incident uh, does not ever happen again. And uh, to that end, uh, we're committed to working with you, working with uh, members of the committee, other members of Congress, uh, to make sure uh, that, that, uh, that that does in fact happen. You have described some of the alleged uh, improprieties and ethical uh, lapses that occurred at MMS due to these, uh, or as shown in these Inspector General reports, not only the latest one, but we recall the one prior to your taking office about what happened in the Denver office of MMS. Uh, and, and it is deeply reprehensible that such uh, activities would be allowed to occur and job offers from the very people they're supposed to be inspecting, accepting tickets to different events, and even behavior uh, goes much beyond that uh, to alleged uh, uh, drug use on oil rig platforms. How cul culpable do you believe MMS is in this whole affair? Chairman Rahal, uh, there are 1,700 employees uh, within the Minerals Management Service. Uh, knowing uh, many of them having uh, actually visited them in their office to announce uh, the ethics requirements that we uh, put into place uh, at the end of January of last year at the beginning of the administration, I can tell you that uh, my belief is that most of the employees of MMS are good public servants. Uh, they get up in the morning, uh, they go to work, and uh, they do their job to the best of their ability. I can also tell you, as is uh, evident from the Inspector General report involving uh, the, the sex and drug scandals at Lakewood, and uh, the more recent Inspector General report that deals with uh, the 2005, 2006, 2007 timeframe, that there are bad apples within the organization. And uh, what we have done is uh, we have uh, taken appropriate personnel actions. People have been terminated. Uh, people have been referred over to prosecution uh, where that uh, has been necessary. And uh, that's uh, exactly what we will continue to do. Uh, we will have uh, zero tolerance uh, with respect to uh, ethical lapses uh, that occurred at MMS. Having said that, I will say uh, of the 1,700 employees at MMS, they continue to do their job. Uh, even in the midst of this very difficult crisis, which is uh, occupying the, the minds of America today, they continue to work uh, to, uh, to collect and distribute uh, the approximately $13 billion a year. They continue to work uh, to try to make sure that uh, everything that can be done to stop this uh, oil from, uh, from, from continuing its leak uh, is in fact accomplished. And so uh, I would say there are bad apples, and those bad apples uh, will be rooted out uh, with every power that we have. You know, I don't mean to insinuate here that we can legislate 100 percent purity among every government employee. Uh, in a perfect world, perhaps uh, that would be possible, but, uh, but I recognize we cannot do that. But it, it, uh, it begs the question, uh, if you have these corruptible people within MMS, does your proposal to split MMS into three different uh, organizations, is that going to help clean house, so to speak? Uh, is it going to address these ethical problems? Uh, ha has your ethics reform package uh, taken hold that you announced immediately after uh, you took office? Uh, uh, how, how are we going to really do our best? Again, recognizing we're not going to 100 percent uh, legislate purity, but uh, h how can we do a better job? Uh, Chairman Rahal, I think it's by having uh, high standards of ethics, uh, first of all, and that's what we put into place. And uh, you will note, uh, including the cover letter from uh, the Inspector General uh, Kendall, who will testify in the following committee, the conduct, conduct that she was referring to uh, happened uh, in the days of the prior administration. Uh, we need to know the truth. So I said to her, I want to find out what it is that's happened uh, from January 20th forward, because we need to know what is happening, whether our ethics reforms have in fact worked. Uh, we have hired people uh, who are high-level people to come in and provide ethics training. We have them set up in the offices all around the Department of the Interior now. So there, there have been major changes with that. Now, having said that, the second point that I would make is I do think organizational change is necessary. And that is why we have proposed and are moving forward with uh, a new restructuring of the Minerals Management Service. 
and uh, it includes uh, several uh, key components of it. The first is to remove the revenue collectors away from the leasing and policing functions of MMS. There are about 700 employees who are located within that revenue treasury function uh, within MMS. I will take those people uh, completely out of that part of the organization and move them over to the Assistant Secretary for uh, Policy Management and Budget. Uh, and so those revenue collectors will not be dealing at all with uh, the leasing and inspection functions. Then we will split the rest of MMS into the two bureaus that uh, I have described, and they are first uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, the future uh, of this country is dependent on having a, an agency that can deal with energy development in the outer continental shelf, and that's both with respect to conventional energy as oil and gas, as well as the new uh, efforts that we have underway during this last year with respect to offshore alternative energy. So there has to be a bureau that does that. And then the second part of it would be the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. And that essentially would be the place where there would be a director that would carry out the police and inspection and enforcement functions of the department. Uh, David Hayes, uh, along with uh, several other members of my team, is leading the effort to, uh, to, to split up the organization into these uh, separate functions. But I think fundamentally uh, the problem, and you uh, raised it well here in this committee on numerous occasions, uh, is that you had too much, much of a mixture between those who were responsible for collecting the revenue and those who were at the same time responsible for uh, giving out leases and then for policing those activities. And so this breakup, uh, I think, will address many of the issues which this committee has been dealing with, including the Royalty and Kind program. The Royalty and Kind program was eliminated, uh, frankly, uh, at, uh, you know, not because people wanted to eliminate the Royalty and Kind program in some quarters, but it needed to be eliminated because we needed to make that organizational improvement. The organizational improvement that we have put on the table will help us now take it the rest of the way. And we look forward, uh, Chairman Ray Hall, working with you and working with other members of the committee uh, to make sure that uh, the organization will, in fact, uh, work to uh, address the, the missions that uh, we've described for the new organization. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We will work with you, and I do have many more questions on your proposal, which will come uh, either later rounds or at a later time. But on behalf of this committee and both sides of the aisle, I think we want, we are, I know we are very serious about working with you. Uh, we want to ensure that the American people, the true owner of these resources, receive uh, just return for the use of their resources, and we want to ensure that it's done in a safe and environmental, uh, responsible manner. With that, I'll recognize the ranking member, Mr. Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for, uh, for being here. I would note that's the second time that you've been uh, to our committee, but we appreciate your being here. Sometimes there are policies uh, in, in this uh, government that uh, have unintended consequences, and the reason I say that is because there have been Democrats in Congress and members of the Obama administration uh, that have been critical of the oil and gas industry for their failure to develop their leases uh, quickly enough. And uh, both those members in Congress and administration have pushed various use it or lose it policies, which presumably is put in place to pressure the uh, oil and gas companies to get their wells operating much sooner. Uh, for example, in the President's budget uh, this last February, uh, he had a new tax that proposed to a uh, new $760 million tax on non-producing leases, now presumably to get those leases uh, active. So I have two questions in that regard. Number one, would the administration rescind that proposal on this new tax? And secondly, does this use it or lose it pressure from the government sometime move these companies to move in a less than environmentally safe manner in order to get these uh, leases uh, in production? Uh, Congressman uh, Hastings, uh, on your first question, uh, the answer is no. Uh, the proposal is one intended to make sure that uh, you don't have vast uh, acreages, including hundreds of millions of, acre of acres out there, which are simply sitting idle and are not being uh, looked at for uh, the possibility of, of, of development. Uh, we felt that was uh, sound as a proposal 
when it was proposed uh, in the President's budget, it's, uh, so it was sound then, it's uh, in our view uh, still sound today. Secondly, on your question as to whether it requires these companies to really accelerate what they do and whether that uh, somehow would contribute to these issues of uh, what happened here with the Deepwater Horizon uh, and other, others, my answer to that is uh, no. There is a uh, safety uh, report uh, that will be delivered uh, to the President. Uh, you know, there have already been preliminary uh, uh, investigations that have, done, have been done about the causes uh, with respect to this uh, Deepwater Horizon incident. Uh, and there are significant enhancements that can be made with respect to the safety of, uh, of, uh, of outer continental shelf uh, oil and gas development. And uh, I think that is uh, the, the way for us to go. But I don't think it has anything to do with uh, the use it or lose it doctrines. Well, okay. Uh, like I say, sometimes you have unintended consequences, and that's uh, that's the reason uh, I, I asked. That's obviously something we need to look at. Let me get back briefly to uh, MMS and the employees, uh, and specifically the uh, IG reports that came out yesterday. One of the IG reports, I think, it was only one page long, but it it reported that one of those employer employees uh, was fired by the Bush administration in 2007. So that was three years ago that this employee was fired for whatever uh, uh, he did. Uh, I, 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 I guess my question is this, and I think it's probably a question that most American people would be asking. If there are individuals that have been identified as doing the wrong things, uh, are they still on the payroll? I mean, why, if, if they've done the wrong things, why wouldn't they be terminated uh, you know, immediately if they were doing the wrong things? I mean, I, what I heard you say is we're doing whatever we can, but the, the American taxpayer has to be asking a question, for goodness sakes, if they're doing the wrong thing, are they still on the government payroll? And that's my question to you. The answer is that if uh, we know that they have uh, done something uh, wrong that requires termination, uh, they uh, have been terminated. And uh, indeed, uh, they have been referred over to prosecution if uh, the, uh, if the uh, uh, facts uh, surrounding the particular incident are, are harmful enough. I will re remind you, Congressman Hastings, that uh, within this department, uh, the former uh, Deputy Secretary of Interior uh, went to prison, uh, and other people have been uh, prosecuted for uh, their failures to do what is required of them of law. We came into this department to clean up that mess and to clean up this house. And uh, we have been working uh, relentlessly from day one uh, to clean it up. And uh, it's uh, an agenda which uh, we will continue to work on. Well, um, I, I just, uh, very quickly, uh, it, my understanding is some of those employees were there at the end of the Bush administration. My understanding they're still on the job. That's my. Uh, we, and I will have uh, David, uh, Deputy Secretary David Hayes, uh, answer specifically with respect to that issue. Okay. Uh, Congressman, we just uh, got this report from the Inspector General uh, uh, literally within the last couple of weeks. We are in a process of uh, reviewing the report. Uh, the Inspector General uh, indicated uh, because of the interest in the issue that she was going to release it, and she did. We immediately put uh, all of the individuals identified in that report on administrative leave and have started uh, proceedings to determine whether more disciplinary action is appropriate. So we moved as soon as we got the information from the Inspector General. Okay, I, so maybe I should ask the Inspector General why this w wasn't uh, made earlier. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from California, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for uh, for being here. Uh, and I appreciate the comments you've made in response to to both Mr. Chairman Ray Hall and Mr. Hastings. And I'd like to join Mr. Hastings. I think I appreciate the actions that have been taken, and I recognize uh, we knew we had a full-fledged scandal in the past administration, sort of like we had in the Fish and Wildlife Service, with people in act, acting in almost what I believe is criminal fashion. And I think we got to go back through this with a fine-tooth comb. Uh, when I was chair of this committee, I'll say that MMS provided a great deal of assistance to this committee and a great deal of expertise. Uh, 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 and, but I think that agency just went to hell in a handbasket. And, and uh, we need to know what we're dealing with. And the reason I say that is this. Uh, I've been involved in, in, in uh, several oil spills. I did the Alieska. I mean, the, uh, the Exxon Valdez for this, for this committee. 
And when you go back through the record, you see the same assurances then that they were giving us today. You see that you see back in, 19, in 1982, they're telling us that any oil spill like people were talking about from a tanker in traffic in Prince William Sound is highly unlikely. Do those words sound familiar? Yes, highly unlikely that anything would go wrong on, 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 on this drilling rig. These assurances aren't worth spit. They're made all of the time, and if you read the internal documents, as, as I'm going back through the, the history, the companies refuse to buy the equipment. Their own internal people tell them, in the case of the consortium in Alaska, to buy this equipment, to update the equipment, and the board turns it down, and yet assurances are given. They said that they could clean up 30 percent of the oil within 48 hours in, in, in Exxon Valdez. They didn't clean up 1 percent of the oil. The equipment they needed was all going to be present. No, they had to go to London to get equipment. They had to go to the Middle East to get dispersants. In spite of the assurances to the people of Alaska and to the people of this nation. So that's why I'm, 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 I'm being harsh here, because we have to know the integrity of this agency. It's very, very valuable. The regulatory regimes that they provide are for the protection, as we now see, of vast, vast er geographical areas of our nation. And so I appreciate your remarks. They're very, very important, and, and as are the, the, the actions to follow in light of the new updated uh, uh, Inspector General's report. Uh, I, think, I think that's essential. You know, we're faced here with a situation where clearly the drilling technology is just so outpaced the cleanup technology. What's very clear, my involvement in Exxon Valdez, my involvement in the recent San Francisco Bay spill, uh, and numerous local spills, because I represent refinery and shipping areas in San Francisco Bay, once the oil hits the water, you lose. The people of this nation lose. Oil in the water, the cleanup is a public relations operation. We go back and review how much oil we've ever picked up out of any oil spill in this country or anywhere else in the world, and especially in open water like the Gulf of Mexico. So these assurances about whether or not we'll have to have, we're going to have an accident, we just can't, we, you can't go to the bank on them. And then the question of what is the technology that's in place to deal with the, quote, accidents? And what is our ability to clean it up? Our ability to clean it up today, if you read all of the documents from what used to be the Office of Technology Assessment from the academies, we're basically where we were with, with, with the Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969. The booms are longer, they're made out of synthetic materials, they're bigger, they can operate in four-foot seas instead of, instead of two-foot seas or one-foot seas. We're still shoveling sand on the beach. That's what we did in 1969 in Santa Barbara. I think that, that, that this department and this government has got to claw back any of these leases that have been let since you've come to office or that have been put in progress based upon old assurances that were made previously, we've got to call back whichever of those leases we can so that they can be reviewed. And I really think we have to consider whether or not we, we can just give a pass to what is really incredible technology, incredible technology. Much of this is, is the, 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 the science for this is developed in my district, but the, but, but, but the, the cleanup is not there. They're not there. I mean, we're still throwing diapers on oil, we're putting straw on the water, we're shoveling sand on the beaches, and we're rubbing, we're rubbing uh, uh, wounded wildlife with, uh, uh, with some kind of solvents. You can't go into 8,000 feet of water, 5,000 feet of water, and believe that that's, that's the response when something like this happens, especially now that we know technically how difficult it is to work in 5,000 feet of water. So I, I, just, I just think we've, we have got to, uh, 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 to, to think about uh, putting a circuit breaker on activities in this department until we know more about it. And I mean, we, the Congress, the administration, the American people, and I think we also have to review the categorical exclusions that were given to drilling here uh, because we now see that uh, those add up to be, a, to be a, a, a catastrophe, both economically and environmentally. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with you on this, on this problem. Thank you, Congressman uh, Miller. If I may respond to just uh, two of your points, uh, uh, you are correct that uh, there is a lot more information, a lot more science, and a lot more to come in terms of safety measures. We have been on this, and indeed uh, that is why 
when you look at uh, the cancellation of the lease sales that had been scheduled by the prior administration in the Beaufort and Chuck GCs uh, in Alaska and in Bristol Bay, we canceled those leases. That's probably 200 million uh, acres of leases to be canceled, and precisely for the kinds of issues that you raise here today, and that is uh, that there are questions about oil spill response capability and about uh, the uh, distances, especially when you're start, you start working in, those, in those, kinds of, those kinds of environments. So you raise uh, very important questions that we have been working on. The second thing uh, on uh, the categorical exclusions, uh, it is a mandate uh, here of uh, this Congress and our national framework uh, over many administrations, uh, Republican and Democrat, I might add, that essentially have put a requirement on Interior and MMS to essentially turn around 30 days uh, on approval of an exploration plan. Uh, that is not appropriate. Uh, we have asked uh, that that be changed, and hopefully that will be one of the reform measures that comes out uh, as part of the President's uh, reform package, which has already been submitted to the Congress. I just say, Mr. Chairman, that if you look at the forensics, what you'll find out is this oil spill was, was the result of a series of activities that were taken over time. It didn't happen on that day for that particular reason. And if you go back in almost all of these oil spills, it was, it was a lack of, 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 of decision making prior, much prior to the action, whether it's a tanker spill or whether it's a fixed platform or a pipeline. I will, Mr. Chairman and uh, Congressman Miller, just add, uh, it is the reason why uh, the President Obama has uh, set forth uh, a uh, presidential commission to conduct a thorough and comprehensive investigation. It will be the kind of investigation that was conducted uh, after the Challenger explosion and after Three Mile Island. And the results of that investigation uh, will inform the American public and this Congress uh, on many of these fronts. Uh, and in addition to that, there are a host of other investigations that are underway that will uh, get to the root causes of exactly uh, what happened. That's very encouraging. Thank you. The uh, ranking member and the chair will recognize members for questioning by the order in which they uh, arrived at today's hearings. Mr. Flake, Arizona is recognized. I thank the chair and thank you for the testimony. Um, there's been a lot of talk about MMS and, and criminal behavior that has happened there in the past. I want to talk about uh, just normal bureauc bureaucratic behavior, uh, or what seems to be, and, and I'd like your response. The uh, Louisiana Governor, Bobby Jindal, has uh, said that he's been seeking permits to build berms on some of the barrier islands uh, for days or weeks now, and has yet to get them. Uh, that seems to be a typical uh, federal bureaucrat response. Um, to hear someone who wants to, and, and apparently has some resources at least, uh, to go ahead and do this, uh, yet he's being held back uh, because what seems to be a, a typical bureaucratic response. Can you, can you uh, answer that? Uh, where, what permits does he need and, and which ones can he not get at this point? Congressman Flake, uh, it is a, uh, a live issue that is uh, under, con under consideration. Uh, let me just uh, say, say to you that um, there are conversations that have been going on yesterday and even today between uh, the national commander, which is Thad Allen in charge of this incident, and uh, Congressman Jindal to make sure that what it is that uh, we do with respect to barrier islands and protection mechanisms in fact makes sense. Uh, the one thing that we don't want to do is to move forward and uh, do something that ultimately will be environmentally worse than uh, other measures that may be more thoughtful. And so those conversations are going on. I have uh, met with uh, Governor Jindal. The President uh, uh, spoke with him uh, day before yesterday on the phone. So we are very aware of uh, the request, and uh, we are taking every action that is uh, humanly possible to make sure that those measures that make sense uh, are, in fact, being implemented as expeditiously as possible. This gets back to what Mr. Miller was talking about. It seems that um, we don't learn anything uh, from prior spills. It, it, it begs the question, what is being done by this administration and the last one uh, between spills? Uh, do we not uh, study whether it, it's, it's useful to construct a berm on a barrier island in case of an oil spill? Um, the, the case where they're, we're talking about now with BP uh, dumping dispersants uh, in the water and uh, telling them, no, we don't know the effect of that. Um, why don't you stop or look for other dispersants? In the meantime, oil is spreading. Perhaps that could help. Perhaps it, it wouldn't. But it just is baffling that 
every new spill, which is much like the old one. As, as Mr. Miller said, we're still shoveling sand on the beach or doing some of the same things, uh, washing off birds with, you know, handy wipes or whatever else. Uh, and, and, and it just seems that we don't learn. And, and so that when the spill happens, something occurs here, we're still wrangling and questioning with a governor who wants to move for literally weeks um, debating whether or not it is good to construct a barrier, or I'm sorry, a berm on a barrier island, when, when that should have been studied beforehand. Uh, that's something that, that somebody within, in, within Interior or EPA or somebody should be doing this, and so we can have more of a rapid response. Also, there's been uh, uh, reports, many reports, of uh, fishermen and others who have been willing to work uh, to, to lay boom or, or, or absorbent material or whatever else and have been told we can't or, or we can't use you or don't want to use you at this point. It just seems, uh, seems wrong uh, that, to turn away help that is there and willing for what seems to be a typical bureaucratic response that we're looking at it, it's under consideration uh, when the livelihood of a lot of people is at stake. you have any response? Particularly, to, to, first, to the uh, what are we learning? Why aren't we, between spills, doing something that actually will inform us for the next spill so we don't have to spend literally weeks deciding whether it's uh, in our best interest to build a berm? Congressman Flake, I, I would respond uh to you uh, in two ways. Uh, first, uh, with respect to the broader question about what is being done. This is uh, the largest response to the United States uh, government uh, with respect to an oil spill in history. Uh, there are 20,000 people out there. There are 1,000 vessels that are out there. Uh, the President has uh, authorized the National Guard and all the states to be stood up to do whatever it takes to protect the Gulf Coast. So no effort. Uh, no resources being sp spared on this uh, protective measure. Now, your no, no. second. Let me let me get to your second question okay. on, on, on on the barrier, on the barrier island. Uh, some have said that you can construct this thing, but it'll get washed out right away. So one of the things that needs to be done is it has to be, whatever is constructed out there. And I have been on bulldozers out there putting out uh, whatever protections need to be put out there in different places and in Alabama, Mississippi, and, and Louisiana, they will be done. And so what uh, the, the, the Commandant is doing now is uh, working with uh, Governor Jindal to come up with a program uh, moving forward uh, that does, in fact, uh, make sense. Uh, and, and he's not, like I can tell you, I've been watching him work uh, this thing uh, 18 and, and 19 hours a day. And I guess the final point that I would make on uh, your comment on uh, preparedness for, uh, for spills, you wouldn't see uh, this kind of global uh, response that you see underway in the Gulf if lessons from the past had not been learned. Uh, so there is a lot that has been learned. Uh, maybe it's not everything that needs to be learned and there will be a lot of lessons that will come from this particular response. But what you see going on in the Gulf Coast uh, is uh, in essence a manifestation of lessons that have gone on from, uh, from past spills around the world. Mr. Chairman, I ask you now, I was consent that the letter that I was reading from to the district court be made a, a part of the record of this uh, hearing. Without objection, so order. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for arranging for this hearing. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, I think the American people are, are right to be demanding of Congress uh, to hold BP accountable. Now, you've said in your testimony that you're sure they will pay all, or they've said they'll pay all legitimate costs, and you've elaborated on that to say that uh, they'll pay all res uh, response costs, all damages, all costs related to cleanup, all economic damages. It sounds good, but what I picture happening is we'll exhaust the trust fund, which is not so large right now, and then spend years trying to recover uh, money, and the, the, the fishing companies and the tourists uh, businesses and everybody else will spend years trying to recover this. Um, uh, you, you, uh, you, you said you've got a letter to the effect that this is good. I, I think we need more. Um, 55 of us, I along with 55 co-sponsors, have legislation, the Big Oil Bailout Prevention Act, 
which would significantly raise the cap on liability, which is at the laughably small number of $75 million. Um, would you join us, would you support uh, a legislative increase uh, in the liability uh, on behalf of American taxpayers, on behalf of the fisheries, on behalf of the small businesses and the tourism industry, on behalf of uh, people all across America who want justice and accountability uh, for the Big Oil Bailout Prevention Act um, so that we can uh, be sure that there is um, formal liability. Uh, Congressman Holt, uh, I'm going to have uh, Deputy Secretary David Hayes uh, respond to the specific question on the liability because he testified in another committee yesterday on the same question. Let me say two things before he speaks. The first is from the executive branch side and the law that we currently have, we have uh, pushed BP as far as we can, including getting their uh, written and very public uh, Within the law that we have. Within the law, yes. within the law that we have. Uh, secondly, uh, within the law that we have, there are also major exceptions to the liability limitation, including gross negligence and violation of uh, operational uh, regulations and a whole host of other things. To be adjudicated so, over many years. Some, um, some of them maybe. Okay, so we, we, so, so we are doing what we can within the limits of the executive branch to make sure they're, they're held accountable. In changing the law, we are supportive. The President sent a package here to Congress. There was a testimony yesterday uh, from the Department of Justice and Deputy Secretary David Hayes that uh, focused in on uh, the changes that we are supporting with respect to liability limitation. So I will have uh, the Deputy Secretary address that issue. Uh, Congressman, uh, the administration yesterday uh, uh, took, the, uh, uh, took the position and we take the position that for the highest, highest risk activities in terms of offshore oil and gas development, there should not be a uh, limit in terms of liability on damages. Uh, and uh, the administration would like to work with the Congress uh, to establish essentially a sliding scale of potential liability caps that focus on the relative risks associated with the activities. But for the type of activity that occurred here, uh, the, the, the administration does not believe there should be a liability cap. Uh, let me just say some of the discussion has had to do with uh, the, the smaller or independent companies and their ability to pay. Uh, the, the consideration should not be that, but rather the ability to harm. Um, a, a mom and pop operation, if you want to call it that, could do a billion dollars worth of damage. Uh, so we have to keep that in, uh, we have to keep that in mind. Um, to follow on Mr. Flakes, Mr. Miller's, and, and the other concerns, um, what troubled Americans so much about this recent, um, uh, the, the, the ongoing uh, tragedy is that the Department of the Interior, um, with all of its agencies, including MS, MMS, not only seemed not uh, not only seemed not to know the answers to the questions, but they didn't even know what questions to ask. They didn't have in place uh, a mechanism for uh, uh, figuring out even what the uh, what the size of the leak was. Is it a thousand barrels a day? No, it's five thousand. Well, no, maybe it's tens of thousands of barrels. Well, maybe it's over a hundred thousand. Um, uh, you know, as Mr. Flake and Mr. Miller are saying, what were we spending our time doing? How can you assure the people that we've got an organization that is putting in place the procedures to deal with things, you know, this you say is unprecedented, but it was not unimaginable. In fact, it was not even unexpected. And yet the procedures for asking the right questions and getting the answers to those questions weren't in place. Well, Congressman Holt, I would say that uh, our view is uh, we have been transparent uh, from day one, as we always have in this administration, relative to pro providing uh, information uh, that uh, we are requested to provide. And, uh, we do have a lot of inf this information that we have provided with respect to what happened. The issues relating to the investigation them themselves, uh, those are under investigation and there will be findings. Those will all be made available to the public just last night or yesterday. The question of whether or not uh, there would be live streaming of the uh, so-called uh, uh, kill today uh, was one of the questions that was addressed. We push for transparency and so as a result of uh, the White House and our intervention, there is full transparency of what's happening uh, uh, on the shore. 
Now, there is a lot of information that we have provided, not only to, through uh, the hearings here in the Congress uh, on the oil spill response plans that were in place in the Gulf of Mexico and a whole host of other things. There are science issues which are important that uh, we want to make sure that we get right uh, because of the consequences. And so I can only tell you that even as we are speaking here today, uh, one of the top scientists in the world, uh, Marsha McNutt, who I brought in to run the United States Geological Survey, is working with a group of scientists to give us uh, our United States of America an independent uh, affirmation of what the spill amounts have been. Uh, that is not. That is to say, we're not dependent on, on BP or anybody else to give us uh, to give us that information. Coming from Pennsylvania, Mr. Schuster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Um, uh, certainly, we all have questions as to who was at fault, what happened, and we're going to have time to be able to figure all that out. Uh, I think the priority, and I think it seems to be the priority, has been uh, to first stop stop the leaking oil, uh, but uh, also to be focused on, on the cleanup. And uh, I've become aware that there's uh, BP has received some reports as many as 10,000 up to 40,000 uh, call-ins on technology, new technology, new processes to clean up uh, the Gulf. And uh, my concern is that they're getting so many. Is that a place that the federal government should be deeply involved with helping to uh, sift through and try to analyze and find and evaluate? Uh, a new technology, a process that can clean up the Gulf quickly and and, uh, and efficiently. I'm concerned that we're not uh, we're not aiding in that that effort. Could you respond to let me, that? Uh, let me uh, say that uh, first of all, uh, good ideas uh, have been welcomed, and uh, you know the BP Command Center in in Houston is uh, taking the ideas from the national labs. In fact, uh, the national laboratories and the United States Geological Survey have allowed for the diagnosis to take place that it essentially is coming up with uh, many of the decisions that are being made today. And so there has been those efforts as well as other ideas that have come in that uh, have been evaluated for their efficiency. And that is the same uh, to be said with respect to uh, the cleanup efforts uh, which are underway and, and will be underway. And I'm going to ask uh, the Deputy Secretary to comment on that question as well. Congressman, you ask a very important and good question. Uh, the National Incident Commander, uh, Commandant Thad Allen, has established in the National Incident Command uh, a repository of all ideas that are coming together. So these uh, folks uh, also have the ability to put them into BP, but those are all coming to the Federal Government, to the National Inc Incident Command, uh, and BP is not making the decisions about whether those are good ideas or not. The National Incident Command is. Uh, and I understand there is supposed to be a 48-hour uh, response time, and um, I hear that Many of them are not getting uh, 48 hours. There's been weeks, and I understand there's, right. there's thousands of them coming in, but it just seems that we really need to be, uh, as a federal government, focused, uh, working with BP and others to, 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 evalu to evaluate these ideas. And, and uh, Commandant Allen has greatly in uh, increased the capacity of the National Incident Command to sort through those, those, those issues, as you would, would expect. Uh, they're, they're, they're a varying quality, uh, but, but okay. some have been useful and are being followed up on. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. Gentleman from uh, Arizona, Mr. Grijalva. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Let me, uh, uh, Mr. Hastings uh, uh, made a, a, an important point, I believe, which said this is not uh, really a time for uh, finger pointing, but a time for accountability. I couldn't agree more, but I, I also believe that there's a historical context to this bill uh, that we have to have the accountability for that, and, and I think that's vital and necessary for anything we do policy-wise in, in, in preventing these things. I think uh, I really believe that removing total uh, liability caps is, is a way to protect the taxpayer. Uh, this culture of industry facilitation and and coziness and promotion by responsible federal agencies has uh, is it, part of the historical context, and I think part of the historical context has I think been the policy and political impulse to drill first and ask questions later, and in doing and I, that was never a sustainable energy policy, and now the bill for this negligent regulatory attitude is uh, is coming due. Uh, I don't believe the drill, baby drill, was, uh, was never a balance call for energy development. And hopefully uh, some of the calculated slogans like that uh, that led to irresponsibility are, uh, are going to be put at bay so that we can have an ample time 
in a dispassionate time to do some real structural and transformation, uh, transformational changes in, in the way uh, we conduct our energy development on public lands and offshore. But one of the questions I have is just looking ahead. Uh, in response to the BP spill, there, as you mentioned, Mr. Secretary, uh, 20,000 personnel, 970 vessels, uh, boats, uh, aircraft have all gotten into the area to help clean and contain the spill. Uh, soon we will be looking at uh, Shell uh, beginning its drilling process in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, does this, Mr. Secretary, uh, what is going on in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, does that uh, require or should it require us to pause until we know the root causes, the impact, and uh, the, the devastation that is occurring in the Gulf of Mexico? The Arctic is much more remote, much more deeper, not as, uh, much more shallow, and, and I really think that this would be an opportunity for us to take a deep breath and look at the consequences that we're seeing now intended or not, and potentially avoid some unintended consequences in the Arctic region. Uh, do you think this is a uh, reason for pause? Uh, Congressman uh, Grijalda, two uh, responses to your uh, comments and your questions. Uh, first, with respect uh, to uh, the culture uh, that is, in fact, what we have been doing, uh, trying to move forward with a balanced view towards uh, development that says uh, you do not uh, drill everywhere and uh, when you do allow for exploration and development, uh, you're doing it in the right places and in the right ways. And uh, you know from what has happened uh, out in the West that there are reform efforts in there have been met with uh, some very uh, sti stiff resistance uh, from uh, our efforts to push it, but we continue to push. The same thing is true with respect uh, to the offshore and uh, specifically with respect to the Arctic. Uh, there were five uh, proposed leases, uh, lease sales that were put forth in the 2007-2012 plan. We announced uh, a month ago, a uh, month and a half ago, that uh, those lease sales would be pulled back because uh, we felt that there was additional information that needed to be developed with respect to science and uh, with respect to oil uh, response capabilities and a whole host of other other, other issues. With respect to the uh, the, the five uh, exploratory wells in uh, the Arctic that are uh, under the approved exploration plans, those are being examined and uh, adjustments uh, will be made uh, in, 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 in the days or weeks ahead that will address that particular issue. And, and uh, back to one of the structural questions that I, I, I believe Mr. Miller brought up as well. Uh, Part of the historical context has to do with the, a simple EA analysis or a categorical waiver as opposed to an EIS, uh, an impact statement. Do you, uh, Mr. Secretary, do you feel that it is now uh, the prudent route to require a full EIS on all potential uh, drilling sites uh, before a lease or a sale is conducted? Or uh, I know you extended the period to 90 days. That's appreciated. Uh, I think the question still lingers, not only is that enough time, but are we getting the full look at potential unintended consequences by doing a full-blown EIS? Uh, Congressman uh, Grijalva, I would uh, first say that it is important to look at uh, the environmental reviews that actually do take place with respect to all these leases. Uh, this particular lease sale underwent uh, seven different uh, environmental reviews, including uh, major environmental impact statements. And they start out at the point where you do a major environmental impact statement before you put together an OCS plan. Uh, you have another environmental impact statement before you move forward to conduct a lease sale. And so there's a variety of environmental reviews that are done before uh, the uh, drilling actually actually commences. There are changes that have to be made, and there are two things that are underway with uh, respect to what we will do with environmental analysis. The first is the joint efforts uh, with the Council of Environmental Quality, uh, Director Nancy Sutley, taking a look at the environmental uh, reviews within the Department of Interior to see how it is that uh, they might be improved. And so that report will give us some guidance on uh, whether uh, there are places uh, for improvement. Uh, secondly, the President's uh, proposal to this uh, uh, Congress that uh, you eliminate the 30-day uh, mandatory requirement for approval of uh, exploration plans, that would be helpful as well because uh, it is difficult to uh, 
do the, uh, uh, the, the rigorous uh, environmental assessment when you are compressed by the law to turn it around in 30 days. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for having this hearing. And Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. In previous testimony that you've given, you've said that you have concerns about raising the liability for companies under the Oil Pollution Act too high, which could drive out small and medium-sized operators in the OCS. And also in your statement, you have acknowledged that BP has, quote, confirmed that it will pay for all of these costs and damages, unquote. Do you believe that we should take the simple step, as some in the Senate have proposed, of legislating a fix that would accept the offer made by BP to alter its contract with the Federal Government to put into law their offer to pay all costs associated with this disaster? Congressman uh, Lamborn, I think as uh, Deputy Secretary David Hayes uh, testified, uh, it is uh, important that uh, we be thoughtful and that we do the right thing. Uh, you know, in the heat of the moment, uh, uh, of a crisis like this, uh, sometimes decisions are made that have uh, unintended consequences. And so the administration has uh, taken uh, an approach uh, that the Secretary uh, and the Department of Justice, uh, the Deputy Secretary and the Department of Justice testified yesterday that would look at uh, the, the liability limitations uh, that are uh, related to the level of risk uh, associated with it. And so as we work with uh, the members of the Congress in fashioning uh, the liability regime going forward, uh, it is important that we be thoughtful about the different uh, risks and realities. Okay. Thank you for that answer. And, and secondly, we all want to get to the bottom of this tragedy, and I think we all agree that finger pointing will not get us there. I, I don't understand, I have to just be real honest here, why you and others keep harping on what MMS did or didn't do in the previous administration when you did know about their these problems when you came into office, and you have been in charge of them for more than a year now. Why aren't we talking about the here and now? Well, we are talking, uh, Congressman Lamborn, about the here and now, and that's why people have been terminated, people have been referred over to prosecution, and we've done a lot to clean uh, the House at uh, MMS. Uh, unlike uh, the prior administration, uh, this is not the, the candy store of the oil and gas kingdom, uh, which uh, you and others uh, were a part of. And uh, so we have moved forward uh, in a manner that is thoughtful, that is responsible, that holds those accountable. And those who violate the law, uh, Congressman Lamborn, uh, will be terminated. And whatever other sanctions of law are appropriate, uh, those sanctions of laws will be applied. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for the remaining moments of time, I'd like to defer to my uh, colleague from Louisiana, uh, Representative Cassidy. Thank you, Mr. Lamborn. Um, Secretary Salazar, uh, just to be specific, although we're breaking up MMS at this time, are you uh, stating or is implying that there is a direct relationship between the actions or inactions of MMS with this particular spill? The uh, testimony that I provided uh, here in September of last year uh, <laughs> referenced uh, two different uh, things. Uh, the first is that uh, the efforts of the chairman of this committee, uh, Nick Rahal, and uh, other members of this uh, Congress, uh, as well as the Senate, were very appropriate. And that is that uh, we needed to move forward with uh, organic legislation, uh, given the importance of the missions of this department. Uh, I, I, I believe that, uh, that very uh, much to be, to, be, to be the case. Um, now, with, with, with respect to administrative actions that we have taken with no, the no, this, department. No, this particular spill, this, uh, in fact, BP just put out a document where they go by half hour by half hour, and they show from their perspective what happened. I'm just wondering, does MMS, in their brief initial internal review, have they seen for themselves a specific uh, thing that they should or should not have done as regards this particular spill? You know, first, uh, Congressman, uh, this is a BP mess. And a BP I understand that, but uh, there's, me, a BP, me, there's a role me, for government. The just, President uh, said there's blame all the way around. Let me just finish. Uh, and, I, and I think what I hear from members of the committee here, that it's important that we know the truth and the whole truth. And that includes uh, the truth about the government and what the government did do or didn't do. Uh, I ordered the uh, Inspector General Mary Candle to take a look at this particular issue to find out what MMS did do or didn't do. And so we'll have uh, investigative information that will come forward. 
uh, everybody uh, needs to be held accountable, and uh, that includes uh, the federal government. So, so I'm not sure I heard the answer. I guess the answer is, if I may interpret, is that you don't yet know if there is a specific role that MMS had in the uh, event beyond the general kind of let me perhaps lack. Let me tell you what I do have. Okay, what I what I have is uh, a preliminary internal uh, investigation uh, report about the incident itself, which is where the focus has been uh, that has been provided to me. Uh, we have, and members, I think, of this committee have also now, at my request, I have uh, ordered uh, British Petroleum to give us a result of their investigation. They have 80 or so people who have been working on that investigation, and we have a copy of that investigation. And we have asked uh, Mary Kendall, Kendall to do two things. Uh, she's the Inspector General of the Department. Uh, the first is to look at the issues relating to this matter uh, of the Deepwater Horizon, and uh, she's involved in doing that investigation. And uh, fourthly, uh, I've asked her to look specifically at uh, conduct of MMS employees that would update the report, uh, which will be the subject of her testimony in the panel that follows this one. Uh, because I want to know whether or not the uh, ethical mandates and orders and additional people and the consequences that were brought to people who violated ethics rules in the past, which we began to implement right after January of 2009, have been effective or whether they have not. And uh, she. But that's not related to this specific instance. No, there is an investigation with respect to this specific incident. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, in scripture we read that who will who will watch the watchman, and uh, what system of internal surveillance and security, sometimes in police departments, called internal affairs does interior and specifically MNS have to or had to watch uh, those who are uh, supposed to approve uh, the project for safety and, and uh, compatibility with the uh, environment around it. Who inside do you have an internal security to watch those people who obviously according to the reports uh, were misbehaving? Uh, do you have that system now? Did you have it before? Or do you propose to increase the system of in, internal surveillance? So make sure we have someone who watches the watchman. Uh, the, the existing system consists of the ethics programs that we have put into place, including having uh, full-time ethics personnel uh, that are involved in training and oversight, uh, including people that we have hired at places like the MMS uh, office in, in Lakewood, Colorado. Secondly, the Inspector General, uh, uh, which has, who has been very involved uh, not only in this administration but the prior administration, uh, helping watch what is going on and uh, reporting freely to this Congress and to the American people, has done uh, an exemplary job in terms of identifying where these lapses have happened. And thirdly, uh, we have proposed uh, the creation of a Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement within, this within the reorganized agency that will help us make sure that you have uh, the appropriate policemen uh, on the job. So the Ethics Committee uh, goes beyond just inspiring people to do what's right, but does it actually watch to make sure that they are doing what is right, a certain internal uh, surveillance? You know, we have, uh, fr from day one, uh, we've had a zero tolerance policy with respect to ethics violations. And uh, when uh, the Inspector General has informed us of uh, ethics violations in the past, appropriate action has been taken, including referrals uh, which I have directed to go over to the Department of Justice uh, for review. Uh, so that kind of an effort uh, has been in place. Uh, the reorganization that included that will include uh, uh, doing an organic act, as uh, the chairman have suggested, uh, should take a look at that issue to see how it can be enhanced. How uh, common was the uh, dereliction or misconduct uh, of those in MNS? Uh, was it uh, part of the culture? Was it becoming contagious uh, before your your tenure? You know, Congressman Kildee, I have to say that uh, in my view. Uh, the events that uh, happened uh, in the first Inspector General report, which we dealt with uh, right after my coming into office, it dealt with the sex and drug scandal in uh, Lakewood, Colorado at the MMS offices there, was scandalous and reprehensible. 
I also have to say, uh, Con Congressman Kildee, that uh, the newest report from the Inspector General, again, that uh, addresses the conduct uh, which is pre-Obama administration, uh, also is equally reprehensible. I think when inspectors are taking uh, trips on uh, company paid jets to go to places like the Peach Bowl, uh, I think that is absolutely wrong and reprehensible uh, and indeed, uh, in, in, indeed criminal. Uh, and so I think that uh, we need to have a tough hand and we will have a tough hand with respect to people who have violated the ethical standards that we expect uh, of our public uh, servants. Was it becoming or beginning to become part of the culture of MS? My, my own view, uh, Congressman Kildee, is that uh, it was a part of the culture of MMS and part of the culture of the prior administration. There was a coziness uh, with uh, industry where industry was running uh, the show. Uh, we have changed that. We recognize the importance of industry and uh, the oil and gas industry will continue to play, I am sure, an important role in the future of the development of uh, oil and gas resources in the country. But the relationship uh, is one uh, which we have worked very hard at changing, so it's the appropriate uh, arm's length relationship that should exist between those who regulate and, and those who are regulated. And that's what's scary to me because I've been in government for 45 years, and when you see a bad cop, that breaks your heart. But when you see a culture developing within a department, then you have a very, very serious problem. So I would certainly commend you for trying to change that culture. And, it, and then, you know, we want to put some people in jail, perhaps, but that putting people in jail does not undo the damage that took place in the Gulf. So uh, we can change that culture. That will be a very important thing. And thank you, Mr. Secretary. If I may, Mr. Chairman, um, Congressman Kildee, uh, you raise a, a very important question that I think uh, this committee and uh, Chairman Rahal have been uh, working on, and that is that, uh, that you, there, there is need for statutory configuration for an agency that has these very important functions. Uh, you know, as I testified here in September of last year, uh, an agency that has these responsibilities of collecting in some years over $23 billion, on average $13 billion a year, an agency that has this responsibility of developing the nation's energy programs in our oceans uh, should have organic legislation. And yet uh, this agency, MMS, uh, has existed by fiat of Secretary Lauder that has been in place uh, since uh, 1982. So the, 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 the proposal that the, the chairman and, and other members of uh, the Congress as well as senators have been working on now for a year to do organic legislation is something that I testified in support of here last year, as well as doing the, the kinds of organizational changes that we have been uh, doing on the ground. But uh, I, th I, I would expect that when we emerge from this, that uh, we will be in a much stronger position to address uh, the concerns that you raise uh, with respect to a, a culture which has uh, not served the American people well. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us today. I thank you for your efforts. And I want to begin by saying that, as my colleagues have said previous to this, I see this process as being a constructive process a process to make sure we learn the things that have gone on, to make sure that things that happen in the future, make sure that these things that have happened are prevented. I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to travel to the Gulf, to visit with some folks down there, to fly over the area from Moss Point, Mississippi, to Cameron, Louisiana, and really understand what was going on. And I had a couple of concerns that I saw, and, and one is I was, I was really moved by the frustration with people in the area, whether it's fishermen or citizens, Secondly was looking at the process there, there seemed to be a disjointedness to it, a lack of coordination. And I know that there's an oil response plan. I know that local governments, state governments, federal governments get together and go through an exercise to look at that, uh, whether it's a tabletop exercise or, or the, the completeness of that exercise, I think is something that needs to be looked at. I know there's an incident command there looking at making sure that things are coordinated. But it did seem like to me that where oil began to appear, uh, there, there wasn't a timeliness in making sure that, we, that the response was there. There was also, I think, some frustration with uh, the local fishermen there as to including them in the process. 
And it seemed like to me that the whole idea of adaptively managing to these crises wasn't part of this process of looking at how do we put together a response plan. I mean, you know, a spill is a pretty dynamic event. And making sure that we have the ability to adaptively manage, I think, is as critical as having a, a plan that looks at all the different scenarios. One element that was very compelling to me is I know the use of dispersants was a critical element of this. And we all know what happens with dispersants. It breaks the oil up into smaller particles. And then it stays, instead of coming to the surface, it stays suspended in the water column or, or eventually goes to the bottom. M one of my questions is, is there an element in the whole planning process that takes into account the suspension of oil in the water column and what we would have to do to respond to that because I hope it doesn't turn out to be an out of sight, out of mind scenario to say, well, as long as it's not on the surface, as long as it doesn't wash up on the beach, then everything is okay. You know, I think the impact of that suspended oil, especially dropping to the bottom, is as detrimental, if not more so, than what may wash up on the beach. So I was wondering if you uh, could to tell us maybe where the planning stands with suspended oil or oil that makes its way to the bottom and how that is incorporated into, uh, into the planning process and the response scenarios. So, uh, Congressman Whitman, on uh, the question of uh, the uh, dispersants and uh, oil that uh, may go to the, to the bottom or will be suspended in the water column, uh, the, uh, Lisa Jackson, the administrator of EPA, has probably spent half of her time in the Gulf from the beginning of this incident. Uh, she is very much on top of that, uh, working alongside with uh, the Department of Commerce and, and, and NOAA, and they are looking at that. Indeed, uh, they will have the third meeting. We have had scientists that have been helping us from uh, the beginning, including looking at the, how, how the well can best be shut off to other issues. And there is a meeting that is planned uh, where the best scientists in the country will come together to look precisely at that issue. So we are very much working on it. On your first uh, observation uh, relative to frustration, uh, it is a reality that there is frustration out there. But I can tell you that there is a huge amount of effort to try to address those specific frustrations. Secretary Napolitano and I, along with uh, six members of the U.S. Senate, were uh, in uh, Fort uh, Fushan uh, uh, day, before, day before yesterday uh, meeting with uh, the oyster and uh, commercial fishermen and others, and uh, what we will do uh, under uh, the commander's uh, uh, authority, uh, Thad Allen, is to uh, do everything that we can to make sure that uh, people who are concerned, whose livelihoods are at risk, uh, who feel concerned about what will happen with uh, their long-term livelihood, that uh, their concerns are addressed. Very good. And one, one last comment. I think the whole concept of adaptive management in these sort of crises is, is critical. And I bring together an example. Uh, so I was talking with some oystermen there, and they said, we have an area of oysters that has not been impacted yet by the spill. And clearly, uh, that's the case. They said, we would like to be able to have the flexibility to go in there and harvest those oysters so we can take advantage of that resource. Uh, and then, if the spill comes in, we would agree that the area should, should be closed. But, but to have in the planning process, the planning scenarios, the response scenarios, the ability for some adaptive management, and I, I realize that there are requirements in place for closures and those kinds of things, but it seems like to me in the planning scenarios that there has to be the idea of being able to adaptively manage to say, listen, during these scenarios, let's go ahead and put the, uh, the bureaucratic hurdles in the background and say, let's give people the power to make timely, thoughtful decisions in how, these, in how these responses come about. I think that's critical and I think that's one of the elements that sometimes is missing in, in giving people confidence in the decision making elements there on the government side. And it goes back to whether it's o opening oyster grounds or sand berms or those kinds of things. Timeliness in decision making in being able to make decisions on the run, responsible decisions, but make decisions on the run in these scenarios is critical. And I certainly hope that that becomes part of the learning process that we go through in this, uh, in, as we evaluate how this is unfolded or this scenario is unfolded in, in the Gulf. Uh, uh, Congressman Whitman, I would only say that uh, Admiral Thad Allen, uh, as uh, the uh, serving uh, until I think yesterday as the Commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, has, has, is probably the most experienced uh, person in the country in terms of, uh, of, of responding to, to these kinds of crises. Uh, we are on the phone with him every day. Uh, the Deputy Secretary David Hayes, the White House, and I 
get an update on everything that's going on, and when problems are discovered, uh, we take action uh, to, to address them, and, and we'll continue to do that. And, and part of it is, as you uh, describe, uh, being able to make uh, quick and uh, responsible decisions that would fall within the rubric of, of what I think you describe uh, correctly as adaptive management. Gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Starbanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Secretary, for being here today. It's really hard to overstate, I think, the scope and dimensions of this disaster. And I was just saying to my colleagues, I think we're on the one yard line in terms of our understanding of, of how much damage this will do um, over the long term. I wanted to return to the, the chairman's question um, at the outset of the hearing. He asked you uh, whether this was a game changer uh, and I guess you could look at that question from a variety of um, uh, angles. I, I'm, I'm focused on whether it's a game changer in terms of our approach to offshore drilling. We've, we've obviously migrated from a, a time when we had a moratorium to when we were then discussing a, um, a certain mileage ban um, um, offshore uh, to where now I guess there's a, a set of presumptions that operate in terms of how we go forward. And I understand that we're focused on the tragedy at hand primarily, uh, but I think it's important to anticipate um, where the next tragedy might occur. And I know we have a number of people um, on the committee here today who are thinking about um, what could happen um, um, in their part of the world, so to speak. Um, it's fair, I think, to anticipate this a little bit because the foundations being laid now in the, in the various comments we hear on what the narrative is going to be going forward. Um, and I would urge you to think about this event as a game changer and to um, <clears throat> stimulate a total reevaluation of the policy approach that we're having now to offshore drilling. Um, I, I speak as somebody who uh, represents a good part of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we have uh, Representative Whitman as well who's got an interest in that. Uh, Representative Craddeville was here earlier. Uh, there is a, a parcel called the Virginia Parcel. It's um, oil and gas lease sale 220, um, which is about 50 miles off the coast of the Virginia's eastern shore. Um, and this was part of the five-year plan that was um, issued uh, for 2007-2012 under the Bush administration um, and contemplated a lease sale there. The Obama administration uh, had announced recently its own intention to proceed with that lease sale um, for that parcel, this Virginia parcel, by 2012, assuming uh, the, uh, the various due diligence uh, panned out. Um, obviously, the Chesapeake Bay uh, is a national treasure, um, and uh, we're concerned, I'm at least concerned, let me speak for myself, about plans to proceed with this. And so my question to you is, in this kind of game-changing uh, perspective that I'm urging upon you, is there, do you believe there will be a reevaluation, serious reevaluation of whether to proceed uh, with this lease sale of the Virginia parcel, this uh, oil and gas lease sale 220, uh, which is 50 miles, as I say, off the, the eastern shore of Virginia. Congressman uh, Sarbanes, let me say first, uh, I believe that the Chesapeake Bay is uh, one of those uh, landscapes of national significance, and there are others uh, around this country, and uh, we will move forward in ways that uh, hopefully has a robust agenda in terms of uh, their restoration and, and their development. With respect to the game changer comment that you make and the Virginia lease sale, let me just say to this committee, uh, there are three options. Uh, the first option is uh, to shut down uh, all drilling and development in the outer continental shelf, so no more OCS development. Uh, the second option is to not make any changes and to simply move forward with uh, the uh, plans as uh, they have been announced. And the third, play, the third is to make adjustments uh, based on uh, the lessons that are being learned. Uh, the President has said from uh, the very beginning of this effort, uh, we will learn and we'll make adjustments as uh, we move forward. And so uh, I would ask you to stay tuned and uh, there will be 
additional announcements uh, that will be coming uh, as uh, the, the President and I consider uh, different options? Well, I a fourth option or a version of one of those options that you mentioned, it seems to me, would be to begin establishing presumptions uh, in one direction versus another. In other words, a presumption against offshore drilling in certain places. Now, these presumptions can be overcome. I mean, they can be rebuttable based on the evidence that's brought forward and, and the comfort level we have about the technologies that are available. Um, but I don't see the harm in beginning a narrative about establishing presumptions against offshore drilling in certain highly sensitive areas, as opposed to, for example, a presumption that goes the other way that then has to be um, rebutted to stop it. Um, and I think that that is the game-changing nature of this event. That's the kind of lens we ought to be putting on it going forward, and I'd urge you to adopt that, not just with respect to the parochial interests I have with the Chesapeake Bay, but for many other areas around the country. And I yield back. Thank you. I will say this, uh, Congressman Sar Sarbanes, that uh, it was uh, precisely because we were attempting to strike those kinds of balances that uh, we said that uh, Bristol Bay in Alaska uh, was uh, a place that was uh, too important to be developed and it ought to be taken off uh, the development map. Uh, and we said that. The President said that. Uh, it is precisely because of your kinds of concerns here that we said we don't know enough yet about the Chukchi and uh, the Beaufort Seas uh, to allow further leasing in the Beaufort and the Chukchi Sea up, uh, up in, in, in the Arctic. And uh, it's precisely also because of your comments that when you look at all of the different uh, factors that are set forth under the Outer Continental Shelf uh, Lands Act, that the Gulf of Mexico was a place where it was envis envisioned uh, there would be uh, robust production because that's where the infrastructure was, that's where you had the state support and a whole host of other other factors. But I, 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 I hear what you are saying, uh, that it, there are places uh, which uh, are too sensitive and we ought not to be drilling there. Uh, you know, our plan said no drilling off the Pacific in large part because of the environmental uh, sensitivities that we see with many of the marine fisheries in that area. And so it is something that is on the radar screen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Secretary Salazar and Deputy Secretary Hayes. Uh, thank you for coming to the committee. The, uh, I think Mr. Kildee said it best when talking about uh, MMS, that um, a concern that there may be a culture uh, uh, that, that leads this agency to be a dysfunctional agency. And, and this is a bipartisan problem. I mean, I, this has occurred not simply over the last administration, but the administration before that. And so my concern is that th this goes beyond the consideration of ethics. I mean, it is the competence. As everything I read about this agency uh, is that it has done, it, it in fact contributed to the very crisis that we have today. Uh, that its lax oversight uh, has led us to the point that we are today. And that it, I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're in agreement that it is, it is vital to the United States to develop these offshore uh, energy resources. And, and certainly that we're in agreement that it is necessary to balance the concerns of um, the economic needs of this country with the with safety and, and environmental concerns. And I don't think, based on what I've heard, and I look forward to the testimony of the Inspector General later on today, that, the, that MMS is capable uh, of doing this job going forward. And there, there is no question that there needs to be reorganization of, uh, of this entity, the separating the, uh, the revenue of the royalty side uh, of this organization from the safety and the environmental enforcement side of it. But I also believe, given the history of this organization, given the fact that there hasn't been the necessary leadership from the um, Department of the Interior in terms of their ability to turn this around to where the American people can have confidence that we can do offshore oil development safely, uh, 
and environmentally in a sound way, that it needs to be moved outside, that these functions need to be reorganized and moved outside the Department of the Interior. Uh, and Mr. Salazar, when you say, I have been on this job since day one, that is since April 20th of 2010. But I do not think that you have been on this job from January 20th of 2009 when it comes to cleaning up this mess in this department. And so uh, those are my concerns. And so, I, you know, maybe you can certainly tell me what assurances you can give to the American people that going forward that, that you can change the really what is an incredible dysfunctional agency, that what is different, what is going to be different going forward in this agency, in MMS, uh, when you were the new sheriff in town on January 20th, 2009, and you haven't been able to make a difference, obviously, given the fact that we're in a crisis situation right now, uh, in terms of going forward. Uh, Congressman uh, and former Treasurer Mike Kaufman, I will say this, uh, that uh, the employees of this department and the history of this department and the history of this Congress and the development of the Outer Continental Shelf has included the development of over 36,000 wells in the Gulf of Mexico without this kind of an incident. And so when you look back at uh, the history and the safety record, uh, there has been a lot of good. And the energy that you have consumed and your constituents have consumed and everybody else has cons consumed, some 30 percent of it, this dom the, the domestic production, actually comes from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, that having been said, there is no doubt that there does need to be reform of this agency. And we have made major reforms, including the elimination of the royalty and kind program, the ethics standards that we have put in place, the ethics personnel. Uh, and we have uh, requested and have been in front of this committee uh, testifying in front of Chairman Rahal that the need for organic legislation is something that we need to embrace. So my own view on it, uh, Mike, is very simple. You, know, you have uh, great agencies in the Department of Interior, an, a, uh, an agency, a cabinet uh, uh, position established uh, back in 1849. And you have uh, organizations uh, within the agency like uh, the United States Geological Survey, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service and other agencies. We can do the same thing uh, with a newly created agency that can manage uh, these uh, areas uh, in our oceans so that we can uh, safely uh, develop uh, renewable energy as well as safely uh, develop our oil and gas resources. Uh, that is my position and that will be my position as uh, we uh, move forward and we learn the lessons from this uh, incident. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I want to uh, commend you for your hard work and your focus on this terrible uh, um, accident that has taken place, not only the loss of lives, but the recovery focus that uh, frustrates all of us, clearly. Um, and I appreciate your, in response to what is a wide variety of views among this committee, uh, talking about the perspective of where we are and the importance of the energy resource. I have several questions I want to ask you. I am one of those that believes we have to use all the energy tools in our energy toolbox. You noted the 30 percent of energy resource that the Gulf has provided, and I think we need to remind ourselves that every energy source that we utilize in this country is not without risk. Over a month ago, we had a tragic coal mining accident that took place. And so our job, I think, in government is to try to deal with the risk assessment and the risk management to assure that we can minimize the risk while allowing uh, this country to, to deal with a long-term energy policy that is long overdue that you have talked about and many of us have discussed. I hope in, in reflection of all of that that this accident, this terrible accident, doesn't uh, end up uh, providing uh, a reason for a death knell uh, to continuing what I think is an important utilization of oil and gas, both on and offshore and public lands. I want to know how you are trying to deal with the situation, though, in reassessing risk assessment with uh, risk management, uh, realizing that you are trying to triage the situation right now. But as we go forward, uh, the, the real question in my mind is, is 
how do we convey a, a sense of confidence that has now been damaged with the American public that your department can adequately manage the risk safely so that we can, we can go forward? Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Congressman Costa. I think that it is uh, important to note one of your uh, premises, and that is that nothing in life and nothing that we do is uh, risk-free, and, and, and there is always going to be risk. Uh, and so the question becomes, how do you create uh, a program that uh, does, in fact, uh, minimize uh, those risks? Uh, we will deliver an interim uh, safety uh, report uh, to the President uh, uh, tomorrow that will address That's uh, tomorrow? That, that will address uh, some of the uh, measures that uh, can be taken uh, to, uh, to increase safety. In addition, the uh, President's uh, Commission to investigate the Deepwater Horizon has been charged with that responsibility as well. And uh, we in the Interior, and working with the Presidential Commission as well, have uh, the National Academy of Sciences Board of, Ca Board of uh, Engineering, the, the arm of, 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 of NAE, that basically will be involved in helping develop uh, those safety measures so that at the end of the day uh, we have a program for the United States of America that does, in fact, uh, minimize those risks. I, I think, if I may, um, Congressman Costa, and maybe for other members of the, of the committee, uh, I think looking at other disasters that have happened uh, in this country in the past and learning from those lessons is important. You know, in the case of the Challenger, uh, the uh, investigation led to a two-and-a-half-year uh, stop of the space shuttle program. And, and there are lessons to learn. And there were lots of lessons that were learned from that. Uh, in the case of Three Mile Island, uh, it led to lots of different consequences, including uh, consequences which we're, we're, we're still live, living with uh, today, uh, some of which uh, some of you agree with, some of which you don't. But the reality of it, of it is that we need to be, at a, uh, in, in my, in my, from my point of view, moving forward in a manner that uh, gets us the answers to the root causes of what happened here and also gets us to, to developing with Congress the kind of uh, safety regime so that uh, this event does not uh, ever happen again. And I will note, uh, just for purposes of the record, and Mr. Chairman, if you would indulge me just because I think I am I'm in uh, Congressman Costa's uh, time, when you look at, at, at other uh, oil and gas uh, spills, if you look at uh, many of them, including uh, one in the Gulf of Mexico uh, back in uh, 1979, the Ixtoc well spill, it's somewhere 3.5 million barrels. Okay? The uh, Gulf War and the oil spills there were uh, somewhere in the order of 10 million barrels. The, uh, I mean, you can go through a whole list of probably 10 which have been very horrific and which are probably much larger even than uh, what we will ultimately see here in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And so how we move for forward here uh, with the kind of thoughtfulness that you uh, describe uh, relative to creating safety uh, uh, is something which is right. Uh, Mr. Secretary, before my time expires, and I hope we will get that recommendation when it comes to the President tomorrow that the committee will receive it as well. well. One other area quickly, the subcommittee that I chair that a number of members are on in June will be reexamining the proposal for that you have talked about today on reorganizing mineral and management services. Uh, I want you to understand that we want to work in, in, in coordination with the uh, Department. We don't intend to rubber stamp the proposal. Uh, I don't think simply rearranging the boxes of minerals and management services is going to suffice in terms of taking the sort of corrective action that needs to happen. And so uh, we will look forward to uh, the presentation next month when the subcommittee begins holding hearings on minerals and management service. Clearly, uh, we attempted to begin reform last year. We actually have held hearings on this for three years now, uh, and a lot more work needs to be done. But we would like your commitment to understand that uh, this is a collaborative process and not one that simply, while I think the Department is on the right track, because change is critical and must happen. Uh, we need to make sure that, the, that, in essence, the fox is not guarding the hen house, as, as we have noted with the, this uh, collusion and, and, and the sort of cozy relationships that have e existed previously with mineral and management services and industry. So we want to, to, to ensure that uh, you are going to be there in a cooperative, collaborative fashion. 
You absolutely have my commitment, uh, Congressman Costa, and uh, the fact is uh, uh, our team that is working on the reorganization uh, is already meeting with uh, uh, staff members, and we'd be happy to meet with uh, you all relative to the development of the program uh, with respect to the reorganization. I, ha I have no interest, frankly, in shuffling boxes around and shifting labels. Uh, we, we are looking at a fundamental uh, reorganization, and uh, we will do that together. Gentleman's Thank time you. has expired. General Lady from Wyoming, Ms. Wilmes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. And I want to follow along Mr. Costa's uh, line of questioning. Um, I'm hopeful that as we continue these discussions, that we can provide you all the tools you need in order to make this agency function well. And that may include things like uh, the opportunity to retain your best employees and to uh, fire uh, employees that need to be uh, eliminated from uh, employment at MMS. So to the extent that you may need some exemptions from normal personnel rules in order to accomplish that, I believe you should request those. In other words, when I was state treasurer, I found out when I had a, 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 a troublesome employee uh, that I could spend my whole second term in office uh, fighting this person if I fired them and, and they were sued me, or um, I could just learn to live with the bad employee. So I just learned to live with the bad employee. And I think that happens too often under government personnel rules uh, that are designed to protect employees, but when an effort needs to be made to purge an agency of bad employees and start over and put in a new design, that sometimes you need new tools uh, in an exceptional situation. I think this is an exceptional situation, so I hope you'll ask for some of those tools. And they include ways to improve the agency by improving the staff through certain uh, salary um, benefits. Uh, one of the situations in a regulatory agency like this is when you get a great employee, the industry that's being regulated recognizes it and they hire them away. So your best employees leave and go to the regulated industries. So if you have a way to reward, maybe even on a quarterly basis, employees that are exemplary, uh, that might provide a retention tool uh, for your good employees and yet also provide you with flexibility to uh, uh, purge the agency of employees that no longer fit uh, the design of what you're trying to achieve. Um, my question, however, is this. Um, there are oil and gas companies based in Spain, Norway, India, Malaysia, Venezuela, Vietnam, Brazil, and nearby the Gulf, China, uh, all of which own leases in the Gulf. How can we assure ourselves that of the safety of their operations uh, when one of the three biggest oil companies in the world, BP, um, engages in a process in the Gulf that, based on my uh, preliminary review, appears to have been 100 percent avoidable by BP. I think bad decisions were made on this rig by BP employees, and the consequences to uh, the Gulf, uh, the environment, and to 11 families who lost family members has just been uh, shocking. So I do lay the blame on BP. Um, to take the consequence then of raising the cap on liability, so the only companies that can participate are those that, that self-insure, and BP is one that self-insures, means that there are only going to be three companies left producing offshore. And one of them is going to be BP, and BP is the company that caused this problem. So I'm, I'm not convinced that some of the solutions being offered and debated today are the right solutions. I am hopeful that as we continue this dialogue, that you will provide us with information on how we can help you make the successor to MMS 
the very best regulatory and collection and enforcement agency it can be with special emphasis on the safety of people and safety of the environment. Now, I haven't left you much, but I'd appreciate your thoughts. Thank you very much, uh, Congresswoman Loomis. Let me just say, uh, first on tools, uh, we will be looking forward to having you provide, uh, help us provide additional tools and the President's uh, requests uh, already before Congress asks for uh, additional inspection capability uh, within uh, the Department so that we can uh, do the inspection. On your second question, uh, whether it's BP or uh, any other company, uh, they operate on our lands, uh, on uh, the American uh, uh, taxpayers' uh, resources, and uh, they will abide by the law of this land, and uh, we will ha we enforce that law. Generally, it's time to start. Gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, MMS used to stand for Minerals Management Service. It now stands for misconduct, mismanagement, and spills. And there are some who would like to suggest that this is somehow or other the fault of the Obama administration. But having spent the last eight years supporting the Bush-Cheney administration's deregulation of oil and gas industry and its lax administration over the industry, some are now shocked at the gambling with our environment that was going on in the oil and gas industry's offshore casino. They fail to see any connection between their own drill baby drill boosterism for offshore drilling and the current spill baby spill catastrophe we now face. And some have even questioned uh, the patriotism of pledging to keep your foot on BP's neck until they fix their own mess. But I want to congratulate you, Mr. Secretary, for your uh, very good work in trying to keep everyone focused on solving this problem. Uh, the fact is that BP has not been entirely candid and open with the American people about this disaster. Mr. Secretary, initially BP estimated that 1,000 barrels of oil per day were leaking into the Gulf. On April 28, uh, 2010, a new leak was discovered and Coast Guard officials pushed BP to increase the estimate of the leak to at least 5,000 barrels per day. However, BP's chief operating officer, Doug Suttles, was initially quoted that day, April 28, saying that he believed that the flow rate of 1,000 barrels per day was accurate and that due to its location, we do not believe that this new leak changes the amount currently believed to be released. Yesterday, BP provided me with an internal document dated uh, April 27, 2010, and cited uh, as BP confidential that shows a low estimate, uh, a best guess, and a high estimate of the amount of oil that was leaking. According to this BP document, the company's low estimate of the leak on April 27th was 1,063 barrels per day. Its best guess was 5,758 barrels per day. Its high estimate was 14,266 barrels per day. BP has also turned over another document uh, dated uh, April 26, which includes a 5,000 barrel per day figure as well. So when BP was citing the 1,000 barrel per day figure to the American people on April 28, their own internal documents from the day before showed that their best guess was a leak of 5,000 768 barrels per day, and their high estimate was more than 14,000 barrels that were spilling into the Gulf every day. Mr. Secretary, do you believe that BP was being straight with the American people when they were citing uh, their low-end 1,000 barrels per day estimate and failing to give the full range of the estimates uh, that they had already developed for this spill? Uh, Congressman Markley, let me say that uh, our push uh, on BP has been for them to be uh, to transparent. And so what you're saying today in terms of uh, the uh, top kill operation uh, is in part in response to our directive. The relationship uh, between the United States and BP under our laws, as I have said, we direct them uh, relative to uh, 
important things like uh, transparency and making sure the information is being made available. The quantity is a very important issue for a whole host of, of reasons, Congressman Markey, and you are right to be focused on those numbers. Uh, because we uh, want to have the United States have independent verification, we have uh, scientists from USGS led by Dr. McNutt and uh, NASA and others who will have these independent numbers and we will share those with you. Mr. Secretary, for that first week, was there any reason why BP would have a financial interest in underestimating how much oil was leaking? The, the, the answer is yes, because liability does apply uh, with respect to the amount of, of, of the oil spill. I will tell you this, that uh, the huge focus uh, on the part of everybody that has been involved is to stop the pollution. And uh, I have been uh, at the Houston Command Center now on, uh, for four different days, uh, including this last Sunday, where I know the energy uh, that is being spent in terms of trying to bring the problem under control. Yeah, under the Ocean uh, Oil Pollution Act of 1990, any owner or uh, operator of an offshore facility that discharges oil into the contiguous zone is subject to civil penalties of up to $1,000 per barrel, $1,000 per barrel discharge, or up to $3,000 per barrel discharge in the case of gross negligence. So for BP, the difference between an estimate of 5,000 barrels, for example, and 14,000 barrels, much less 1,000 barrels per day, could really be the difference between uh, 5 to 15 million barrels per day in fines and 14 to 42 million barrels of oil per day, a uh, 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 million dollars per day uh, as a penalty. Mr. Secretary, does the flow rate of the leak have an impact on whether the top kill procedure that BP will try today will be successful? Does knowing the accurate flow rate impact on their ability to be successful? Let me, uh, Congressman Markey, I think with respect to this uh, Apollo 13 type of uh, project which is underway as we speak uh, 5,000 feet below the sea level, that the best of data and uh, diagnostics uh, have been uh, developed. And uh, that is why uh, Dr. McNutt has essentially been camped out there for three weeks. Uh, Dr. Chu has uh, been there with the team. The labs have been there. And so uh, the exact question on the amount of flow, uh, I, I can refer to the, to the scientists on it, but I don't think it would have impacted uh, what is happening today with respect to the top kill operation. Well, BP continues to say that the amount of oil leaking doesn't affect the response, uh, that it doesn't matter. But I think that the American people need to know the true extent of the problem that we are facing. The scientists need to know whether uh, there are other undersea plumes of oil lurking out there in the Gulf, uh, and BP should want to know as well so that uh, as they are trying to outrun the well with their top kill procedure, exactly how fast the oil is leaking, because that determines what it is they have to do in order to stop the leak. Congressman Markey, and if I may, Mr. Chairman, because I think this is a very important point uh, and we have been working on it uh, very, very hard for uh, some time, I would uh, ask the Deputy Secretary to give you an overview of what it is that we are doing to come up with <coughs> flow measurements independent of BP. Uh, before yielding to the Deputy Secretary, uh, we understand that BP is ready to proceed with their top kill procedure and that you want to be able to leave here by 12.15 so you can monitor that situation. Is that correct? That, that, that is correct. I'd like, I'd like to, there's some critical decisions that I just want to make sure I'm watching. We understand, uh, and I'm sure all the committee members understand that, but you will leave the Deputy Secretary here to respond to questions. Is that accurate? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I will be very brief. Uh, 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 after this response, though, we will go to Mr. Cassidy on the uh, minority side, uh, as he is from Louisiana, and allow him the final questioning of uh, the Secretary. Just very briefly, Congressman Markey raises very important points about the, uh, the need for independent scientific uh, understanding of the flow rate. Uh, uh, Commandant Thad Allen uh, formed a flow rate task force last week. Uh, that, that is made up of, of distinguished uh, government and independent scientists. 
that flow rate task force will issue a report as soon as this afternoon uh, that will identify from their point of view uh, what the flow rate has been using three independent different types of analysis. Uh, so I think it will be a very useful and, it, and, uh, and thank you for bringing attention to the importance of this issue. I thank you. I thank you for your work on that. I think the American public will really be um, glad that we finally know how big this bill is. And, Mr. Secretary, again, thank you for your good work on this. Uh, project. Thank, thank you, Congressman Markey. Before recognizing Mr. Cassidy, as is normal procedure, Can uh, and perhaps Mr. Inslee on our side for last, very, very last questions, uh, all members will be able to submit questions for the record, and I'm sure the Secretary will respond uh, to those questions that are submitted in writing. Yes. Is that accurate? Yes, Mr. Chairman. With the gentleman, you, or chairman, I, I yield to the ranking member. I, I think that's very important because this issue is important, and a lot of members aren't going to have an opportunity to ask questions. But I do want to note the last time, uh, Mr. Secretary, you were here was eight months ago in September, and and we submitted questions then that we have not gotten responses for. So I hope that I know that uh, I'm sure you don't know that, but we have not gotten responses, and we'd like to uh, uh, get responses to those questions in addition to the ones that will be asked uh, uh, here today. So I, if you would do if you do that, I appreciate it. Gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Cassidy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Secretary, part of the frustration in Louisiana, we understand that the $13 billion that MMS has taken in from offshore royalty probably 60 to 90 percent of that is off the coast of Louisiana. Now, having said that, there appears, uh, Mr. Holt said earlier, there was a failure of imagination. As I understand, by the second day, there was more dispersant used than had ever been used at one location in the history of oil spills. Uh, that there had never been an ROV, independent survey, of the biology of the seabed in deep water drilling. That the only test in terms of control of deep water and ultra deep drilling, the effects of oil and dispersants, have been done in Norway. That wasn't ultra deep, that was deep. Now, it does seem as if a, an appropriate response would have been proactive. It would have said, okay, if we're going to have a spill, if we're going to use a dispersant, what is the effect of that dispersant? Because there is as much concern about the effect of the dispersants, what I understand is basically kerosene, upon our fishing industry as it is upon the oil. Um, there's also concern, again, that the um, Stokes Law, which I don't know anything about except to quote it, is uh, impeding the flow of oil to the surface. Therefore, it is going to stay subsurface, as one of my colleagues mentioned, and that this indeed will have a different impact on the plume, et cetera. Now, this has not been studied proactively. I see somebody later will tell us that you're putting together a task force. For we in Louisiana, who have been contributing 50 to 80 percent of these royalties, Needless to say, we feel a little bit like it's after the horse has left the barn, after the oil has left the well. Any comments upon that? Yeah, Congressman, what I would say is that uh, Administrator Lisa Jackson has been on top of these issues of dispersants uh, from day one. Uh, they have uh, pushed BP to use less dispersants. They have looked at uh, whether or not there are less. Uh, if I may interrupt, though, that is actually not the question. The question was, did everybody, somebody ever game out and say, listen, if there is a major oil spill in the ultra deep, what dispersant will we use? What do we know about the volumes used? What will that do to the plume? What will that do to the fishing industry? And that seems to be an after the fact that Ms. Jackson is asking BP not to do it. I guess I'm asking, why wasn't it considered before the fact? Was there again a failure of imagination, as Mr. Holt suggested? What I would say, Congressman, is that there was a very massive oil spill response plan uh, that had been uh, submitted that. Uh, assumed worst case uh, scenarios and uh, it's that oil uh, spill response plan that is being implemented as it is being implemented there are issues that uh, have been raised with respect to for example uh, the dispersants and their long term impacts uh, the EPA has been very involved in it as well as other scientists as well as scientists from uh, uh, the uh, Louisiana State University and uh, that is one of the reasons why we have scientists uh, taking a look at it I'm told that there's never been one. I've talked to my scientists. They wrote this book. Uh, they say they've not really been involved from the coastal environment, um, and they're very frustrated by that because their publication list for oil in the marshes apparently exceeds any other university, as you might expect, and also that there's never really been any research done on the activity of oil in the ultra deep. Now, it really seems that if we're going to have a response plan, there should have been research done on what does oil do when it's released in the ultra deep. That actually seems, again, a failure of imagination. Yeah, well, Congressman, I would just say this, um, and I'm going to have the Deputy Secretary uh, respond as well, but um, uh, 
There are many people here who, uh, frankly, have been involved in uh, the development of the Outer Continental uh, Shelf programs, including the passage of the 2005 and 2007 Energy Policy Acts, which uh, contemplated uh, the development uh, within the deep water. There are many hearings that were held with respect to all of those changes that were made in the law. And there were many issues uh, that were dealt with in all those hearings, as well as within the agencies, uh, relative to the opportunity as well as uh, limitations concerning deep water. Uh, the nation made a judgment that uh, deep water production was something that should be encouraged and indeed incentivized uh, by, by this Congress and, and by other administrations. So the fact of the matter I guess, I guess my question, though, there is a California spill of national significance trial run that was done in 2004. And uh, oh, I'm in my mess, I no longer have it in front of me. But it basically says that all the expertise in dealing with a large scale spill had been lost and that middle management was not capable of taking care of such a spill. Now, this is the California spill of national significance, which is not even deep water. And so it seems as if the um, the preparation, I, maybe there was a good response to that, but again, I'm asking again, was there something done for deep water in particular? Let me have, let me have David, uh, the Deputy Secretary, respond uh, uh, specifically to that question, but I can tell you that you would not have uh, the largest uh, response in the history of the world uh, with respect to an oil spill taking place if there hadn't been uh, preparedness in place. The Deputy. Uh, just respond that uh, Commandant Th Thad Allen, uh, who is the National Incident Commander, was also in charge of the uh, the exercise that you're referring to. Uh, he believes that was very successful. He administers along uh, with the Coast Guard, along with EPA, the uh, Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Uh, they have the primary responsibility in terms of developing response capabilities uh, on the dispersant issue. They, uh, in particular, EPA has pre-approved uh, the the, the dispersants, so they're available available on site. Uh, the deep water implications are, are uh, ironically, uh, now that there is a deep water ability to inject the dispersants, they are using far, far less dispersant than if they were relying totally on surface. Uh, and in fact, uh, Administrator Jackson re reached an agreement with uh, BP and ordered BP to reduce the amount of overall Let me interrupt, dispersant. though. This, I was told that by the second day, more dispersant had been used ever than in the history of any other oil spill. And that the, so maybe in small volumes it was okay, but for a catastrophic spill, it's unknown as to those effects. Well, well, sir, this is an extraordinary event, and uh, and uh, as the secretary referred to, Administrator Jackson, working with uh, your local universities, have established a a follow-up protocol, and then, as you know, for the last several days, they've been pressing very hard to ensure that the dispersants that are being used are, in fact, of of uh, 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 will break down quickly, will not have long-term effects. There is no question. I put this in the same category as what the Secretary has been talking about. We are going to learn some lessons here. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the Congress, in its wisdom, uh, put together a response plan that required preapproval of dispersants precisely for this reason. We are going to find out if that was adequate or if new uh, 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 protections need to be put in place. I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Inslee. Thank you. Mr. Secretary, uh, no wind spill has ever hurt anyone. That is why I am very appreciative of your permitting these the start of wind shore, offshore wind uh, farms, no sun spills ever hurt anyone. That is why I am appreciative of the President being at a solar cell manufacturing plant in California today. I just hope you will use this spill again as an inspiration to try to jog our colleagues in the Senate to get off the dime after a year and pass a clean energy bill so that we can move to the next cleaner sources of fuel. I know the President believes that. I believe you do. I just hope you will continue your inspirational efforts. I want to ask you about the Northern Seas, the Chukchi Sea and the Beaufort Sea specifically. We know there has been a statement that we are going to put a moratorium on permits for drilling, but I am told that there are some um, wells that are not started yet by Shell in the Chukchi or Beaufort Sea under I think it is lease 193. And I read a statement by uh, Vice President uh, Pete Slaby of Shell of May 14th saying we have mobilized every piece of equipment that is not local. We are heading up there to do this. Uh, can you commit to us that you are going to withhold permits on those uh, until we get this thorough review to make sure that MMS acts more like the FAA and less like a group that is not doing their job? C can you commit to us that you withhold permits on those? final permits and so we can get this job done of fixing this problem before they start drilling there? Uh, Congressman, let me just first say that uh, the safety 
uh, report, which uh, I have been working on uh, for most of the evening and night, and uh, some today will be delivered to the President. Uh, then there will be a series of decisions that will be made with respect to whatever adjustments uh, need to be made. Uh, and so stay, stay tuned on, on your question uh, relative to the specifics on the uh, exploration uh, wells uh, approved in, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and I will remind you, as I have uh, said to the committee before, that um, the plan had been uh, by uh, the prior administration to essentially open up everything, Pacific and Atlantic and everything in the Arctic. We pull back in the Arctic, uh, specifically in Bristol Bay, in the Chukchi, and in the Beaufort, canceling tens of, uh, of uh, millions, I think, of acres uh, that were going to be leased, precisely because there are some scientific spill response and other issues that need to be addressed. I will take this opportunity as well, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, in response to the question, to also say that um, I think it underscores uh, the leadership of uh, many members of this committee. Uh, to move us forward into a new energy uh, frontier, uh, to do the kinds of things that are happening with respect to wind energy and uh, solar energy, where we, by the end of this year, just in interior on public lands, will have uh, permitted over 5,000 megawatts of uh, wind and solar and geothermal energy. And seeing uh, Congressman uh, Bishop over there, I will also say that I was in Utah, the little place, Milford, Utah, a few weeks ago. Uh, and. Uh, the people in that high school, the kids essentially had uh, developed the idea of uh, creating uh, a new energy revolution within that part of Utah. So they now have underway uh, a wind energy farm that is, will produce uh, 1,000 megawatts of power, already producing uh, over 200 megawatts of power, I believe, a geothermal uh, plant which is uh, producing uh, close to 50 megawatts of power right in that same facility. Mr. Secretary, and the construction of a transmission line for uh, renewable energy which will take the renewable energy to the places where it is. I'm there. really excited about that. We need to string that line over to the U.S. Senate so they can get a little energy. We've been waiting for a year on them. I want to ask I one agree. last question quickly about the control of the drill site. Americans are very frustrated about this, as you know. And uh, you made some comments about perhaps the federal government moving BP aside. Um, uh, the incident commander, Thad Allen, suggested, well, BP is really the folks that have the expertise on this. What I think Americans want are the, the folks with the expertise to be doing the work. That might be the industry right now, because the Navy is not equipped to really do this work, or NOAA, they don't have drill rigs. But they do want somebody who's going to be making decisions that are based on the good policy and the protection of the environment rather than economics, which is the federal government. So I think the people sort of want a mix of the federal government here who make a decision to protect them with those who have the expertise that might be the industry. I guess the question is, is there a circumstance that we should be thinking about that the federal government would assume control over this drill site and be making the executive decisions with executive decision-making authority and contract with the industry to perform that work, guaranteeing thus Americans the feeling of confidence that they got a government that's making decisions for them, not a private enterprise that's maybe shorting them, but still using the expertise that we need. Is that something that we might be looking at at some point? And if so, in what circumstances? Uh, Congressman, it's a good question. It is. Uh let me just say, Admiral Allen, whom I worked with every single day uh, from the beginning of this, uh, and I are in full agreement here, uh, we are holding BP accountable. Uh, and in that accountability uh, effort that we have underway, we have them by the neck and we will keep them by the neck uh, to do everything that has to be done here, uh, which, is, which is right. Uh, we have uh, put into place at the Houston uh, Command Center for BP uh, the best of scientists in uh, the entire world. The global scientific community is focused on uh, what to do with this well in Houston, and it includes colleagues that I mentioned, Secretary Chu, Marsha McNutt, the heads of the labs, and others. And so everything, what I can guarantee you, Congressman, is that uh, everything is being done that is uh, humanly and uh, technologically possible to uh, stop the pollution and then to make sure that the pollution is cleaned up and that those who are affected by this horrific uh, incident uh, are, in fact, uh, made whole. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, David. Uh, Mr. Brown, George is next.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I thank the Secretary for coming as he departs, and I thank the Deputy Secretary for staying. So, Secretary Hayes, uh, just want to say this massive and ongoing environmental disaster has destroyed untold natural resources, resulted in a tragic loss of life, and will have a devastating impact on the economy of the Gulf Coast region for years, probably decades to come. First and most, most important thing we need to do is get this spill under control before it does far more damage. Tough questions must be asked in the days, months, and years ahead to determine what happened, to hold those responsible accountable for their actions or inactions, and to prevent a disaster from like, like this from ever happening again in the future. I'm concerned that the federal government has not taken the lead in the response to this tragedy. Too much reliance has been placed on BP to find and fix this problem. Sadly, we are now 36 days into this disaster, and the federal government is still looking to BP to take the lead in solving this problem. We just heard the secretary give that testimony. He's pointing his finger at BP and doesn't point the finger at himself or the department. Mr. Deputy Secretary, this past Sunday, uh, well, Mr. S the Secretary Salazar said this past Sunday in regards to BP, quote, we are 33 days into this effort and deadline after deadline has been missed. He went on to say, if we find they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing, we'll push them out of the way appropriately, unquote. On Monday, Admiral Dad Allen, who was appointed by the President to oversee spill relief efforts in the Gulf, was asked whether the government was pushing the cleanup initiative strongly enough. Admiral Allen replied, quote, we're actually defining it as we go. This is an unprecedented anomalous event, unquote. And in response to the Secretary Salazar's statement on BP said, quote, to push BP out of the way would raise the question, to replace them with what, unquote. They just well, no far, further going on, they just need to do their job, unquote. Between the Secretary's statements today, and those he's made recently, and actions taken to date by the administration, it is clear that the federal government has not taken the lead from day one. The protection of American interests is the responsibility of the federal government, not BP. I heard the Secretary over and over say that it's BP's responsibility and would not take responsibility, he said over and over. That you guys have been doing everything that y'all can do, and I find that totally incorrect. Deputy Secretary, do you believe that the federal government's response and the department's response has been adequate? Uh, I absolutely do, uh, Congressman. Uh, we are implementing the law that this Congress passed, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, which establishes responsibility uh, on companies like BP who, make, who create this kind of damage uh, to, to uh, fully fund and implement the cleanup. Uh, it also establishes a structure under the National Contingency Plan that established a national incident commander uh, here, Thad Allen, that has the responsibility uh, an oversight uh, of the uh, of the responsible party that is absolutely occurring. Let me let me uh, suggest a separation between two issues because I think you're confusing uh, some very different situations. Uh, first of all, in terms of the response itself, uh, Thad Allen uh, and the Coast Guard uh, has stood up uh, a, an organization of now over 20,000 people in the Gulf of Mexico responding to the spill. You've heard the testimony today, the 1,000 ships, the, 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 the thousands of employees, the, the millions of miles of boom, the dispersants. This is the most coordinated, uh, hard-hitting response effort ever. The other piece of it is what's going on in terms of stopping the flow. Uh, and and uh, the, we have, we have uh, experts from the Navy. We have Nobel Prize winning Dr. Stephen Chu. We have the heads of three national labs. We have the head of the United States Geological Survey, all embedded in Houston. Every decision that BP is making, they are asking us for permission, and we are directing them what to do. Uh, today's top kill is, the, is a culmination of intense uh, effort with them. Uh, there are, we are 5,000 feet down. 
There are, uh, 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 the, the U.S. Navy has confirmed that actually the best technology uh, is the technology that industry brings to bear. They're doing it under our direction, and uh, their, their, their complete livelihood is at stake. There is no question, I don't think, about the commitment of the federal government and, uh, and, uh, and the effort of response. And for someone who has been working on this matter uh, since uh, hours after it occurred, the suggestion of the federal government is not putting everything at this uh, ever, uh, uh, effort uh, is, uh, is disappointing, to say the least, and, and incorrect by any empirical measure. Well, Secretary Hayes, I respectfully disagree with you. Uh, reports come out of Louisiana where federal uh, vessels were sitting there idle and the state had to take its emergency management authority to try to get those uh, responding to this bill. And I don't mistake that there are two pressing issues. One is stopping the continual flow of oil into the Gulf, and the second one is cleaning up what's there. But it's my belief and understanding that the federal government has the responsibility under the law to take the lead role, and you guys have not done that. Shouldn't you have taken expired. the lead role from the very beginning? The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, who's next on our staff? A uh, gentlelady from Virgin Islands, Dr. Christensen, is recognized. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for, this, for holding this hearing. Uh, Deputy Secretary, there have been calls for a national disaster declaration, and I recognize that the Secretary has testified, all, and I realize that all hands are already on deck. But the impact of this disaster, as my colleague said, will be far-reaching and last a very long time. In your opinion, is there more that could be gained, or would the response be any better, any stronger, if this Deepwater Horizon spill were officially declared a national disaster? Uh, Congresswoman, um, I am not an expert in the, the legalities of the different types of declarations and their impacts. My understanding is that because we are under the jurisdiction of the uh, Oil Pollution Act and we have access to the billion dollar fund and also the responsibility of BP, that the, the normal kind of, of, of disaster declaration that, that triggers the, under the Stafford Act actually requirements for states often to provide matching funds is not appropriate and actually would be, uh, would be counterproductive in this situation. However, there are, there are many complexities. Uh, there, there's a different type of disaster that's, that's, uh, that's, that can be called under the Magus and Moss Act dealing with the fisheries. So I, I do know this, uh, that, that the administration and the Department of Justice has the lead on this with the Department of Homeland Security is making sure that every resource available through whatever mechanism, declarations or not, uh, uh, is appropriate uh, are being followed up to the maximum extent. Okay, thank you. And um, I just want to clarify, I, Congressman Inslee sort of asked this question, but the testimony of the Secretary says that no applications for drilling permits will go forward, um, there's a moratorium in place, but it's been reported that uh, drilling product projects are still being approved. Can you give me some reassurance that that moratorium is in place and sure. none are being approved? Sure. I'm happy to uh, clarify that point. Let me first say that the, the, the policy was to uh, put a moratorium on approving new applications to drill uh, offshore until the Secretary presents the report to the President on interim safety measures. That will occur tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, so the moratorium is focused on the fact that since April 20, uh, no new applications to permit to drill in offshore uh, have been approved uh, or are going forward. There were two, actually, that were approved after, after um, uh, April 20 but suspended uh, on May 6. So there have been no processed or, and allowed to go forward new applications to permit to drill. Confusion has arisen because while uh, ongoing, uh, in connection with ongoing drilling uh, uh, processes, there have been some revisions uh, and, and some, some side drills basically for safety purposes. Mm -hmm. They have been allowed to continue because they are, those are ongoing. changes and ongoing things. Those have been reported as new permits. They're not new permits in, the, in that sense. Also, it's been reported that, that there have, been, have continued to be approvals of exploration plans. Yeah. Uh, that is true. 
Uh, that's because we are forced to respond to those within 30 days. But the approval of an ex exploration plan does not lead to a drilling permit. That's a separate action. So we've been we've been uh, we worked hard to uh, put this pause button on. Uh, it's on until tomorrow when the president will receive the report, uh, and and then uh, the decisions will be made about what to do going forward. Thank you. Um, one of the most important parts of managing a crisis is the dissemination of information to the public. And when I listen to some of the officials from Louisiana, watch the news, it seems as though the message on what, why, and where is really being led by the media and by people who are panicking because they are concerned for their, their and their constituents' livelihood. Um, and then there's sometimes conflicting statements from different government officials. What's being done to improve and have the federal government coordinate and really take control of the message that's coming out on this disaster? Because it just creates more confusion and um, really hampers the ability for the administration to move forward. So it's a very good question. It's a, it's a, it's a tremendous challenge. Uh, uh, coordinating uh, the messaging and the information flow. I was last Thursday uh, in the the Huma uh, uh, Command Center and also Mobile, Alabama Command Center. All of the command centers have what's called a Joint Information Center, where uh, under the under the Coast Guard's uh, jurisdiction, uh, all of the uh, Interior Department, Commerce Department, BP folks all are working together, uh, and the communications all come out of the Joint Command. Uh, that that process is up and running. I think it's going well, uh, and and that's the primary mechanism we're we're doing. But it's a tremendous coordination challenge. Uh, but Thad Allen is up to it. I think. Thank thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Jim of Louisiana. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary, for coming today and speaking with us on this important topic. I represent the fourth district of Louisiana. As uh, Dr. Cassie and I are both uh, m members from Louisiana. Over two weeks ago, our governor, Governor Jindal, and you heard this discussed uh, earlier, uh, re requested a certificate, requested permission to dredge our shoreline in order to build berms for protection at the, bar at the barrier island level to hopefully protect, protect our coastline and our natural resources our wildlife and so forth. About six days ago, uh, the entire delegation, Democrats and Republicans alike, sent a letter uh, to the Corps of Engineers and to Admiral Allen requesting an answer. Uh, so we're well over two weeks. Uh, the people of Louisiana are waiting for an answer. Uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary, are we going to get an answer today? Uh, as the Secretary testified, uh, uh, Commandant Thad Allen is in daily contact with Governor Jindal on this issue. I know that he's continuing to work it. The primary issue is whether uh, building the barrier island will do more harm than good uh, in terms of, of fighting off uh, the potential of an oil spill impact. Uh, and, uh, and those discussions are continuing. I am I'm sure they're going to mature into a final decision very, very soon. The, the main concern of the, uh, of the National Incident Commander has been not to make the situation worse. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. De Deputy Secretary, do you think we'll hear within a week? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, could I expect perhaps an answer in three to five days? Would that be a good window? It's really probably best to put that to Commandant Thad Allen, but I can assure you uh, that uh, that that uh, answer is forthcoming. But more importantly, discussions are ongoing. There are daily discussions between uh, Commandant Thad Allen and the governor. Well, uh, the the secretary referred to conversations. You referred to discussions. Uh, isn't this, sir, really paralysis through analysis? Uh, the, we have 84 miles of shoreline that are now affected. Uh, by the time we figure out whether this will work or not in some way uh, be a problem for the environment, it'll be too late to do anything. Well, the, the, the proposal as an, uh, originally envisioned was to build 90 miles of, uh, of uh, barrier island. Uh, the uh, uh, concern is that it would wash away literally in a matter of months. Uh, with the first storm event, and, and perhaps more importantly, 
that in connection with the dredging and filling operation, that, that oil would be drawn into the marshes that it is trying to protect. Those are very serious, very serious questions that go to the appropriateness of this mechanism as a spill response mechanism. Uh, uh, Thad Allen has a National Incident Command team working on it very hard, working in communication with the delegation and with the governor. Uh, uh, we, we have a shared interest uh, in getting the right answer, uh, and, uh, and I'm confident uh, the Commandant and the Governor will, will close on this soon. Okay. Thank you, sir. To kind of switch the topic and kind of go back to something that we've been talking about all along, uh, we've been hearing comments from the Secretary or other side of the aisle how the problems with MMS uh, have been very problematic and, and have carried on to this, this uh, situation that we have today. But the fact is that this has happened on President Obama's watch. Now, I'm not here to point fingers. I'm not here to blame. I think President Bush and his administration, no doubt, clearly has blame in this that BP does as well. But I think the American people are growing very, uh, I think, unhappy uh, with the constant statements made, and the Secretary made them today, other members of, the, of uh, this committee did as well, that it was the problems, it was the candy store, I think was a comment made by the Secretary, uh, that it was a close relationship between corporate America and the Bush administration. Isn't it, sir, really destructive and really kind of covering uh, one's backside to continually point fingers at another administration? rather than accepting the fact that this has, in fact, occurred during the Obama administration, and wouldn't it be uh, more constructive to uh, look at what's happening at this moment and going forward, rather than constantly uh, pointing fingers? Uh, uh, perhaps so, Congressman. The reality is that we just received an Inspector General report within the last 48 hours that focused on uh, inappropriate behavior that occurred under the previous administration. Those issues are front and center, uh, and, and, uh, and the Secretary was presented with that situation when he walked in uh, 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 with the Lakewood, Colorado issue. So it's, 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 it's a reality that it's something we've had to deal with, and we're trying to deal with the cultural issues that have been raised throughout this hearing. I, I will say this. Um, um, what we are most interested in, I know you share this, is finding out what really happened here with this particular circumstance. We do not know uh, whether the, the culture of MMS really had a connection with this or, or not. Um, we're going to find out. Uh, the combination of the, the, in particular, the President's Commission, uh, the National Academy of Engineering work, uh, the, the joint USGS MMS investigation overseen by the Secretary, uh, all of these things coming together are going to give us the answers, and uh, and I think we're all going to look forward to getting those answers. Uh, that's that's uh, that's what we that's what we need that's where we need to be. Gentlemen, time has expired. Gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Heinrich. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Under Secretary, this exploratory well was permitted under a categorical exclusion, as was alluded to earlier. It was based on a prior EIS, uh, environmental impact statement, and an EA and an environmental <laughs> assessment both done under NEPA. That EIS evaluated the potential environmental impacts of drilling in the western and central Gulf of Mexico, and the EA evaluated the impact of the lease sale that led directly to this well. The EIS estimates that we can expect two to three blowouts in the central Gulf and one to two blowouts in the western Gulf as a result of the 2007 to 2012 lease sales. The EIS, EIS also stated that since loss of well co control events and blowouts are rare events and of short duration, potential impacts to marine water quality are not expected to be significant. Given that we now know that a blowout in the deep water may be of very long duration and is obviously has uh, significant impacts on marine water quality, do you believe that MMS should reconsider the underlying EIS and EA and other similar existing NEPA decisions that don't take the consequences of a deep water blowout very seriously? I'd answer in two ways, uh, Congressman. Um, 
first of all, of course, as the Secretary testified, um, the uh, Council on Environmental Quality is, uh, is working with us uh, to do a thorough review of the NEPA policy as it applies to Outer Continental Shelf Leasing Act. Uh, so we're, we're going to take a stem to stern look uh, at, at uh, NEPA reviews and there are some limitations under current law that we've talked about already. Uh, the other observation I'll make is that uh, under the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, um, there is actually a requirement for uh, a spill response plan to be put together on a worst case analysis. This is not under NEPA, this is under, the, under OPA. And, the, and BP was required to put together uh, a, a spill response plan that, that truly did, I think, uh, assume worst case, 260,000 barrels per day for 30 days. Um, and uh, uh, bigger than our current spill. It's because of that that we are, we are able to respond as we have been in terms of the, the boats, the dispersant, all those issues. Um, uh, but there is no question uh, in, in, I think, all of our minds that this accident, uh, which, which um, uh, 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 needs to, needs the, the question of worst case analysis needs to be updated with an idea of uh, the lessons of this accident. We have to learn what those lessons are first uh, and the, the uh, uh, investigations will help us there. So we look forward to it. I can't speak now as to whether these specific EISs are, are still adequate or not, but, but they'll be part of our review. When we talk about the Alaska leases that have been referenced on a number of occasions, and some of those having been, been granted, I know many of them were uh, canceled before they were actually leased, do those leaseholders have a contingency plan in place for some, if something like this happens in the Arctic? Uh, they do have spill response plans uh, 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 in place. Uh, the, those, those, uh, those are all appropriately uh, subject of additional reviews, I think. Is, is MMS, do they have the authority to require these kinds of contingency plans for, for all leases moving forward? And is that being exercised? Uh, they do and they have. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the very robust spill response plan that BP is required for in the Gulf, the 260,000 barrels per day uh, response capability plan uh, was approved by MMS. Uh, and uh, so they do have that authority, that responsibility. I, I know the response is unprecedented, but I wouldn't exactly characterize what BP has been able to do over the past 37 days as a successful response right, right. to this situation. And I think we need to be careful about how we characterize that. I mean, theoretically, if, yes. if we use the, the correct response, um, either the, the dome or a top kill procedure would have been successful weeks ago. Right. No, I think you raise a very important point, uh, uh, Congressman. The, the traditional spill response plan looks at those traditional assets that are brought to bear when there's a spill. What we have here is a, is a situation that, uh, uh, where, where the, the, the containment at the first instance uh, has been the problem. We need to look hard as to whether we have uh, appropriate mechanisms in place for that at all, and we will do so. Thank you, Under Secretary. Mr. Chair, I yield back. A gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate Secretary, Under Secretary Hayes staying here. I'm sure you have the Secretary's ear, so you'll bring back our comments to him as well. I hope uh, that you'll be Sorry that Mr. Inslee is no longer here, that you're up to taking his challenges of wind and sun spills so that as soon as you've cleaned up the coast, you'll then solve the problem of hurricanes and skin cancer at the same time. I'm sure you'll go forward with that. And just for the record, uh, the Milford Flat will not produce 1,000 megawatts of power. At the best, under current perfect conditions, it can do 200 megawatts of electricity. I just don't want anyone to accuse the Interior Department of giving false information. So let me go to this. As you know, I have been somewhat critical of the Interior Department in the past. In this particular issue, though, I have no intentions of trying to do a simple and quick rush to judgment. I think this committee wants to know, number one, what has the government done? Two, what could they have done? And specific answers to what Mr. Cassidy was trying to get as to the relationship of MMS to this particular situation. We need those specific answers, and I recognize, Mr. Chairman, this is the first of a series of, mes me of meetings that we will have to come up with those specific answers. Once those answers are there, then we can make some kind of adjustment to that. So I appreciate your willingness to be there, but I also appreciate recognizing this is the first step, very 
skimming of the surface, and we'll come up with more specifics as time goes on. I also recognize that MMS has a, a checkered past. During the Clinton administration, MMS made some very bad decisions that cost this government a great deal of money in favor of the pi private sector. During the Bush administration, there were problems that the investigation of which was initiated and completed during the Bush administration as well. It pointed up to other problems. There are still problems with MMS. And as long as the rhetoric doesn't get in the way, I really hope that we can work together in a bipartisan way to solve that particular problem, which is not unique to your administration, but is still there with this administration and has been there in the past, and we can move forward on those areas. I am grateful to find out that Ms. Kendall is going to initiate a report uh, on this particular situation. I am under the hope and assumption that as soon as that report is available, Congress will get a copy of that report in a timely manner. That was the question, sir. I'm sure that is the case, as, and, uh, and uh, the Inspector General can answer for her own sake in the next panel, but I'm sure that's the case. I, I look forward to that. As you told Representative Holt over there, there is the in, in, intention of being a very open and transparent right. administration. Uh, Mr. Hastings asked for certain documents to be brought today. I'm under the assumption they were not brought today. Uh, I, I can't, did not come with additional documents. And when we have asked for documents that deal with the southern border, uh, that they have yet to come as well. To your knowledge, because we asked this of Mr. Jarvis yesterday in a hearing, to your knowledge, when there was those brainstorming meetings that dealt with the monuments, were those initiated by uh, requests from the White House, or did they come, the meetings come, to your knowledge, from the Interior Department? They, were, they came from the Interior Department. Okay. I appreciate that with, once again, the request that those documents that we have repeatedly asked and have yet to appear are given to us so that we can participate in the process and do the role that Congress was required to deal with. And I hope that also applies to this particular situation. Because as we've heard today, there are a lot of questions that have been asked, very few answers are there. It may indeed be that the department does not yet have the answers to share with us, but when those answers are there, we hope we can get them in a timely manner, and then we can make some adjudication about how we go forward in the future and what was or was not the occasion in, in, down in the Gulf. I thank you for your time and being here. Thank I yield you. back, sir. Well, didn't use the word unintended consequence at all. I yield back and expect the unintended consequences, sir. The gentleman from Oklahoma is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, appreciate you having the hearing today. Also, uh, uh, Dep Deputy Secretary Hayes for being here, uh, and also uh, for the Secretary for being here earlier. Uh, a couple of points. I'm kind of like Mr. Bishop. I've been critical of uh, the department. Uh, on a number of issues, mainly about access. I'm one of those rare pro-oil and gas Democrats who uh, does support drilling, uh, but at the same time, I think we need to be thoughtful about it. Uh, I think this is a, a time for us to pause, uh, for us to, um, to be very careful. Uh, I do want to say uh, to you and to the Secretary, I've watched uh, your response, and I know that you all kind of have the weight of the world on your shoulders right now, and you don't need someone else to be piling on. Uh, so I'm not going to do that today, and I just want to thank you for your service to this country. A uh, couple of the questions I do have, and this was something that uh, Congressman Holt brought up, was the, he talked a little bit about independent oil and gas companies and being involved and whether or not they should be drilling uh, in the uh, offshore and because of the liability issue. And you, you mentioned OPA 90 a couple of times. Uh, you know, we have this fund, you know, there's a $75 million cap, but then you have this fund over a billion dollars that's sitting there that's used for these cleanups. Would it be better, instead of just having an unlimited cap, uh, would it be better, because then you, as was mentioned by other uh, members, uh, you would only have a few companies that would be able to drill, including like the Chinese and uh, folks that aren't necessarily friendly to the United States. Would it be better to solve Rush Holt's problem to 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 increase to no to increase the and, and all of our problem to increase the uh, fee on the oil and gas industry to raise that fund level to four five. $10 billion, whatever the, num the, the magic number is, and I don't know what that is, so that when there is a big disaster um, that, you know, we can clean up, uh, you know, uh, the pollution, we can, we, can, we can solve the problem that both Rush Holt and I both have, while still allowing independents who produce a, a vast majority of a lot of the oil and gas uh, that's out there. I mean, we have a lot of partnerships 
For instance, we have a company in Oklahoma, they've since sold their offshore. Uh, Devon Energy uh, partnered with Chevron and found a really big discovery. Um, we want that kind of technology sharing. We want those kind of people, uh, Oklahomans and others, creating those jobs to be out there. So my first question is, can't we accomplish the end goal of cleaning up the mess and having the money there without necessarily keeping all the folks out? That's my, my first question. And my second question is about uh, the, the moratorium. Uh, I've had a lot of the shallow water drillers in my office, uh, the folks that drill anywhere from 35 to 400 feet. I think they're vastly different than what you've got in the offshore. They complete wells in a short amount of time. Uh, there could be literally thousands of people laid off if the moratorium goes past, I guess the 28th is the day. Um, we're very concerned about that. And also even the moratorium in the offshore. Uh, but I obviously understand you've got to go in, you've got to do the inspections. I also want to applaud uh, you all for br looking at breaking up uh, MMS. I think it's a positive step forward. Uh, again, I'm not here to talk about the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, sorry, Mr. Bishop, or, or whatever, the Obama administration. There's a lot of blame to go around and all that. I just want to find the best solution, and I think – uh, I, I'd love to hear your, your thought about Open 90 and, and Mr. Holt and I's issue that we could work out, and then also about the, the, the drilling. I'd love for you to say, you know, 28th, we're going to say we can start drilling again. Uh, Congressman, on the, on the first uh, point, um, the administration is, is absolutely open to working with the Congress uh, on this suite of issues. Uh, the, the, I think we have a shared interest in making sure that uh, the companies that operate uh, 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 in the offshore uh, have the wherewithal uh, to uh, respond to any uh, problem that arises. Uh, we have that shared view. Um, I, I uh, could only speak to that issue of the, of the cap, um, but uh, there, uh, there may well be other ways to skin the cat, so to speak. And, and uh, well, let, let me, because my lights, the light's getting yellow. Let me just say uh, real quickly, uh, I'm just worried in this political environment, someone's going to attach this to a must-pass bill, sure. and all of a sudden we're just going to have the Chinese drilling on our offshore. I, I understand. Uh, the the other, uh, in terms of the shallow water issue, the moratorium, this pause button, if you will, uh, is is associated with a report that will soon be delivered to the president, uh, and, and then decisions will be made. Uh, that's about all I can say about that. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for your service. Mr. from Texas, Mr. Gomer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Deputy Secretary, uh, we heard the um, um, Secretary Salazar talk about uh, his wanting to, to help us and want to get the answers, but uh, we also have heard the ranking member talk about requests that were made eight months ago for which we have not got answers. Uh, that really needs to be responded to. I don't care who's in the majority. There ought to be respect enough for this body and this body's oversight that we get answers within eight months. And not only that, there ought to be enough respect for Congress within Congress that when Congress can't get answers, we demand them and don't reward an agency until they comply. So I'm hoping, um, maybe it's a little bit Pollyanna, but I'm hoping for the future we're going to have a little respect from the uh, Department of Interior and get answers to questions. Also, uh, looking at an AP article, the AP obviously didn't get any respect from DOI, but they had requested um, to information so that they could put together stories, indicate they got information from DOI that uh, Deepwater Horizon was inspected 40 times during its first 40 months after September 2001 when it went into the Gulf, but that more recently the numbers keep being amended by MMS as to how many times it was uh, seen, went from 26 to 48 times uh, reported for the 64 months since uh, January of 2005, and a Freedom of Information request by the AP 
uh, indicates MMS only released copies of three inspection reports. And I know people would love to know, and I know you said you're looking forward to getting the reports and finding out what happened. Why couldn't we just see the records? If we could just see the records, we can read those. As a judge, I frequently had to review evidence myself. And you get, you get people to come in and know what they're talking about, hopefully, and to give you their uh, assessment. But why can't we just say, here's the report. Here's the, here's the blowout preventer testing that was done. Here's the record that it wasn't done. Here's what happened. And then we would know, and we wouldn't have to wait from somebody within MMS or DOI to tell us what happened. Can, couldn't we yeah. get those reports just, here's what happened without an investigation and waiting for that? Uh, uh, well, Congressman, uh, with all due respect, uh, we are being inundated with requests for information at the same time that we are devoting uh, an incredible effort at addressing the ongoing... Well, and ongoing, I can understand when, you understand when you wait eight months to respond to questions we ask. It really over time. But if we could just get the copies of what has happened. It doesn't do you any good to come in and say we've we're got all these requests building up when you keep letting them build up over months. Well, my time, one of the problems is having only five minutes. Let me get to this. We heard Secretary Salazar mention, quote, a prior administration when industry was running the show, um, and uh, he says the relationship between MMS and Big Oil is arm's length now. And we know we've had hearings in this room. We've had the IG come in, and, and we got down to two people that may have known about that prior administration when industry was running things in 1998, 1999, and they left out the language on the price control uh, for the leases that just made millions for big oil and cost our federal treasury millions and millions of dollars. And when, we, when I asked the inspector general, why didn't you talk to these two people? He said they both left government service. There's nothing I can do. And I couldn't believe he wouldn't even try to call them and see if they would voluntarily respond, but he didn't. And uh, it turns out one of those went from the Clinton administration to become First, Vice President of Health, Safety, and Environment for British Petroleum North America. Then she was promoted to Director of Global Health, Safety, Environment, and Emergency Response for British Petroleum. And then she became General Manager for Social Investment Program Strategic Partnerships at British Petroleum. And then last summer, Secretary Zalazar said she understands the value of partnerships, so he's now put her with um, minerals and management in the Department of Interior. And so I, I hope that you'll look closely into that cozy relationship the President has talked about wanting to end. And I'm very concerned that if minerals and management is overseeing British Petroleum, just how cozy this has gotten. And uh, I, I realize my time's expired, but I'm just asking Please look into this. The inspector general refused, and we have to rely on you to help because Congress is not adequately looking into it. Thank you. Just, just, for, the, just for the record, uh, uh, Sylvia Baca has been completely recused from this matter because of her prior employment with BP. Oh, when you say completely recused from this matter, does that leading up to the blowout preventer failing to work properly? She's, or not, since she's, it, she's not been involved in offshore uh, energy issues. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kahn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Deputy Secretary, thank you for being here along with the Secretary to give us an update on what's taking place. And I, you know, I, I do appreciate what the administration and what the Department of Interior has been trying to do in light of this accident. And my recollection is correct. Uh, since coming to office, the Department of Interior uh, has been eliminated the scandal plague royalty and kind program. I mean, that's already been taking place. Established new ethics standards, if I recall, within the department. Uh, balanced MMS mission to include renewable energy production as part of its portfolio. You've slowed down the new leasing that was taking place for a more thorough review and analysis before any of the leasing uh, decisions are, are ultimately made. Um, moved in the direction of a more science-based determination as far as lease approval uh, within the agency. And obviously the Secretary announced the division of MSS now into separate entities so that there's a more focused attention on what needs to be done. Uh, all necessary steps 
But I know the people in western Wisconsin are wondering why this happened and what steps can be taken to avoid it from occurring in the future. How much will the Department be taking into consideration what other countries have been required, especially in the area of deep water drilling, as far as improvements that we need to be making to ensure that any future project, or even current project that's taking place right now, meets the optimal, me me uh, optimal measurements of safety and, and uh, again, science-based uh, determination to avoid something like this from occurring in the future. If I recall, I think Canada already requires a secondary uh, pipe or a secondary valve to be drilled at the same time the primary one is in any of their uh, deep water drilling. Uh, am I correct in that? I don't know the details of that specific point, uh, but to your more general point, we are very interested in having world-class uh, standards, and that means uh, benchmarking against uh, other countries and taking the best that they have to offer. Uh, and in fact, in the report that we're preparing for the president, we've 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 started that function. That there already is a uh, a lot of international uh, discussion along these lines. Um, and and uh, but but uh, we we take your point. It's uh, we want to be uh, have the best standards in the world. Is that going to be part of the commission's purview as well? Absolutely. When they're moving forward, is taking a look be at part the best the practices president. in the industry. And absolutely, what's absolutely. Right. Yes. And also, I think, uh, uh, taking a look at the opportunity for secondary safety valves to be established in case we get a blowout of this yes. order, that there's uh, a second and third alternative in order to shut something like this off quickly? Yes, Congressman. Yeah. Now, obviously, the Inspector General is going to be testifying uh, briefly before us, too, and we've known for some time that we've got a cultural problem within MMS. And in her report, I think she indicated very clearly that a lot of this is human nature, just playing out. First of all, I think we've got a terrible problem with the revolving door of those in the industry going into the overseeing agencies to conduct oversight from the place they just came from, and also vice versa, those within going to the private industry, knowing how to play the game. I don't know what we can do really to get at that other than some brighter line rules uh, in order to prevent what appears to be a very cozy relationship and a lot of transition from public and private sector work that's been going on for a very long time. Have you guys been thinking about this and coming up with some recommendations for us to consider as far as the revolving door problem that I think I and others we We, 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 we absolutely have. In fact, uh, as, uh, as the Inspector General, Acting Inspector General may uh, testify, um, uh, as soon as uh, we received the draft report, we, we were looking internally at, at some new rules that, that we might consider, and we were in a dialogue with the Inspector General about some new requirements that we would have on the revolving door uh, theory. Uh, so uh, we're absolutely attuned to that. Now, is it uh, maybe ethically, but is it uh, prohibited by law? or by criminal penalties from accepting gifts or kickbacks or things of that nature from the industry that you're supposed to be overseeing? Oh, there, there are some very uh, bright lines in terms of what can be accepted as gifts. Uh, uh, and, and I think there the, the lines are, are much clearer and, and the ability to take disciplinary action is, is much more clear. I think the, the issue that, uh, 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 that Mary Kendall has raised appropriately is the, is the cultural question of the, of the friendships and the close relationships, et cetera. Uh, that's a harder nut to crack, and we look forward to working with uh, the Inspector General. I will say that uh, we have really um, uh, enjoyed a very good professional relationship with, with, uh, with the Acting Inspector General and, and we in fact, um, uh, she is working with us uh, on a special safety oversight committee function moving forward uh, for precisely this reason. Uh, it's, it's, it's very instructive to get uh, reports to the Inspector General's office. It's even, I think, uh, more helpful to, to get the input and experience of the Inspector General as we look going forward uh, at new, new things we can do to avoid the problems so that we don't have those reports. Well, I appreciate that response. It's going to be crucial for that type of collaboration and cooperation as we move forward. Because when you get comments that we're all oil industry, it's very troubling. And that's right. not the way this is supposed to, supposed to work. Yep. So we'll look forward to working with you on that as, as we move forward. Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen, Chairman. Gentlemen, time has expired. A uh, gentleman from uh, New Mexico, Mr. Lujan, is recognized, whom we uh, formally recognize as a new member uh, prior to your arrival this morning. Th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to working with you with all the 
committee members and the staff as well to really make a difference here, Mr. Chairman. Um, Deputy Secretary, following the 89 Exxon Valdez spill, we heard reference to the 1990 um, Oil Pollution Act that was uh, brought forth and what that did to shift responsibility to these companies, um, putting the federal government on a back step, if you will, as far as having that direct involvement. Um, learning from that, how can we ensure in the future that the federal government will have the capability to take greater control of cleanup efforts, whether it's creating uh, or establishing um, an entity where we can utilize personnel, equipment, technical expertise from the private sector to drive this home and, and make sure that we're, we're doing the things that we should be doing off the bat? Uh, Congressman, I think that'll be part of our uh, uh, our debrief, if you will, after after this uh, incident has been controlled. I, I think a lot of the uh, confusion uh, is is um, uh, is is more in terms of the relative roles. I mean, the, the 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 Oil Pollution Act. You're correct. Did make it clear that the companies have responsibility. The uh, uh, BP, in this case, along with some other parties, our responsible parties are, have to open their checkbooks, have to make it happen. Uh, but the reality is that the federal government also uh, is, is the primary player here in telling them what they have to pay for. Uh, and that is what we are doing through Thad Allen and the National Incident Command. Uh, but like everything else associated with this incident, uh, we will look forward to uh, 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 looking back and seeing whether there, it would be useful to clarify the law uh, or clarify the responsibilities. And uh, Deputy Secretary, you know that uh, um, there's been a lot been said by this. Mr. Dudley from BP, uh, Mr. Uh, Settles from BP as well, uh, talking about some of these attempts that uh, failed attempts to stop the leak, that it's never been done before, that um, there's no certainty at these kinds of depths. Why was it that BP did not move forward with trying to kill the well to begin with? Why, why is it that they, all these flows, it looks like all these attempts, it was to keep the flows alive as opposed to go in and just shut it off? Yeah, this was a catastrophic failure and um, if there had been a, a technical way to stop to kill the, drill, uh, the well earlier, uh, you can be assured they would have done it and we would have required them to do it. Um, the, uh, w what happened was essentially the entire infrastructure associated with uh, uh, killing the well was lost uh, with the explosion. Uh, so what's been happening over the last uh, couple of weeks uh, in particular has been a reconstruction effort uh, to uh, enable what is, is uh, uh, scheduled for today, the top kill, which requires um, under pressure uh, very large volumes of, of drilling fluids to be uh, injected in the well. Uh, and at 5,000 feet without delivery mechanisms, um, those, uh, those mechanisms had to be constructed uh, and, uh, and it's been a 24-7 operation to get to this point today. And I, I think there's a lot of concern there because in some recent articles coming out of the Washington Post, this one from uh, yesterday, um, it, it cites that there's rig workers and lawmakers have faulted BP for failing to pay enough attention to a spike in pressure in the drill pipe and for neglecting to ask for a second cement and plug in the well, both of which could have been uh, addressed with more time. Instead, rig workers have said BP pressed ahead with substituting seawater for drilling mud in preparation for closing the well and moving the exploration rig off the site. It then goes on to say that time worries weren't the exclusive province of BP. In a 2006 trade journal, Transocean General Electric Engineers wrote about how to save time on a blowout preventer test by leaving test valves in place. At a conference in 09, a Halliburton official spoke about how to get cement to set faster. And in a conference call last August, uh, we continue to hear about what that means to saving costs. Um, leaving these test valves in there or turning them where there could have been other ways to shut this off are things that I hope that we'll look to do. And I certainly hope that um, now with what's being done with the restructuring of MMS, that we're able to address the concern that was issued to notice to leasees that MMS had issued dating back to at least 2002. That requirement was lifted for most wells in the central and western Gulf of Mexico to have some of these contingency plans as well. And so going forward, I hope that there's, uh, we're able to conduct a thorough audit of those that don't have these contingency plans in place. I hope that we can learn that um, agencies can work close with one another as you have done 
to bring experts necessary here to address these issues, but make sure that we're using modeling and simulation to be able to find out if these, th these contingency plans are truly going to work, because we have seen that that absolutely is not the case. They, they're still saying today that they know it's not working. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it very much, sir, and yield back my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. DeFazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm puzzled. Is there or is there not a moratorium? I mean, there's press accounts saying that permits have been issued, statements uh, that the Secretary put forward said you're required to issue these uh, permits upon 30 days after, you know, within 30 days an approval or disapproval. Are, are you under a moratorium or not on permitting? We are not approving any, uh, app we have not approved uh, any new applications for drilling in the deep water since April 20th. And we, we are, we've put a full stop on, on all, after May 6th, all new applications to permit to drill, uh, period, shallow water and deep water. So uh, the, the confusion, Congressman, has been that there are revisions to permits, so-called uh, side tracks, uh, bypasses, those, those appear on the MMS website as though they're new permits. They are not new permits in the sense of new operations starting. They're ongoing operations, drilling's already occurring, they've hit a safety problem, they need to do a bypass, they need to do a side drill, move around the problem. We are allowing those to go forward here during this period. Those are not new applications to, for, for drilling. And the, also the important thing also, Congressman, is that this was in place until the President gets the report, which looks like will be tomorrow, uh, and then decisions will be made about, uh, about the future. Okay. Uh, now, in the case of the uh, test wells in the Arctic, um, do they have to have a uh, catastrophic uh, a plan for a catastrophic failure before they drill the test wells? <laughs> We have not received yet the APD requests from Shell for those uh, proposed exploratory wells the wind, uh, for what this request? summer. The, the, what? The, uh, they also have to uh, submit an APD, an application for a permit to drill. Right. So um, uh, what, what, uh, they have an exploration plan, but the next step is for them to send us so-called APDs, mm -hmm. which, w which are the final step for review. And at that point, we review the entire situation and decide whether to uh, allow the exploration uh, activity to go forward or but, not. But exploration activities do require a catastrophic response yes. plan. Yes, yes, they do. Okay. Yes, they do. And Absolutely. I mean, you know, I mean, you can envision the concern about, you know, sure. spill even a fraction of this magnitude in the difficult conditions in the Arctic. Yes. So yes. I would we, assume that there's going to be extraordinary scrutiny applied to their uh, what they allege they have in place to deal with this a catastrophic event. That's an appropriate assumption, Congressman. Okay. Now, um, in a hearing last week, it came out that I mean, there's a lot about uh, the blowout preventer having been modified and whether or not it had a hydraulic leak, it was functioning properly, the condition of the batteries and that. But there was one thing e even more disturbing than that beyond potential for malfunction or actual malfunction is that uh, it turns out that these uh, blowout preventers cannot sever uh, the pipe where it's joined. So 10 percent of the pipe being used on these deep water wells these blowout preventers are not designed to deal with. How can we be allowing this to go forward with blowout preventers that can't do the job, even if they work? Right. Well, that's a, it's a very serious issue. There are really two issues there, uh, as you may know. One is whether the, 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 the pipe rating is, uh, uh, matches the, the ability of the shears to cut through it. And then the second issue is that uh, where the pipes are put together, you've got a thicker uh, material and, and uh, the likely failure of those uh, shears. Um, we're going to need to look into this. My understanding is, I've been told, that in this case, the, the, uh, uh, the shear rams had the, the, uh, the capability of cutting through the, this, this uh, quality of pipe. But that obviously is going to be a factual question for this matter uh, and will be part of the more general review. Uh, the MMS has done studies through the years on this question and tightened up these regulations, but we're going to look to see whether they have to be tightened up more. Right. Uh, press accounts say there was a study done by MMS, a subsequent study done 
uh, including uh, which was 07, a BP engineer saying that basically that uh, most or many uh, blowout preventers were not capable of cutting pipe of this this thickness. So. Uh, you know that that's a very serious concern. Right. We don't want to have blow-up preventers as a feel-good device because I don't feel too good about this one right now. No, so absolutely, uh, you know that that's something that I, I really think you you need to be looking at. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Well, yeah, certainly. You'll. I, I think that the, the thank you, gentlemen, for yielding. You you put your finger on a very important point here. What we've had demonstrated over the last 37 days is that if the oil is out of the pipe. We have no means to control it when it comes to the surface. We just have no ability to do this. We can try to manage it and all that. So we're back now to reliance on these blowout devices. And until such time, I mean, you can have all of these, rec all these plans you want, but the only thing that stands between us and a catastrophic event is that blowout device. Because we now know, I don't care what they file about how many ships they're going to have in place and all the rest of it, uh, you can't deal with it once it's in the water. So I think, I just hope the end, this is kind of a, the, the fail-safe point for the moment, unless technology changes or, or procedures mm -hmm. change. I think Mr. DeFazio just raised a critical point here, the idea of going forward, relying on uh, shears that, that, that may, may not, uh, we don't even know on other existing wells whether they're sufficient to be placed in the right place. The gentleman, you for one last question? Yes, I do. What about the possibility of the secondary pipe uh, also going in at the same time as the primary pipe pumping, pumping it out? Would that be another uh, alternative to uh, uh, avoiding something like this? I'm not yet a petroleum engineer, uh, <laughs> Congressman. I seem to be heading that way, uh, but uh, I really yeah, can't like speak to that. We, we all seem to be, and that's what's scary. You know? Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Gentlemen, time has expired. Gentlemen from Maryland, Mr. Craterville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Deputy Secretary, first of all, thank you for being here and uh, for your service in what clearly must be a very, very difficult and stressful uh, situation. You know, oftentimes when we have these kinds of events, the first reaction, obviously, is to go after someone and figure out uh, who's to blame. Um, it seems to me the first issue, as you've correctly pointed out, is figuring out how do we stop the leak. In that regard, assuming today what we're trying to do today doesn't work, then what? Uh, there, there is a uh, backup plan uh, that the uh, Secretary alluded to uh, briefly uh, that uh, um, uh, that, that uh, the Secretary Chu and uh, the directors of the National Labs have been working on with BP uh, that that would contain all of the flow uh, and um, uh, that would that would swing into action. Uh, I'm sure that uh, if the top kill fails, uh, w there'll be a lot more discussion of that backup plan. Uh, but uh, uh, I, 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 again, I'm probably not the best person to speak to the the P's and Q's of it. Let me, let me go back to a number of, obviously there's been a lot on the, on the um, issue of the blowout. It's my understanding that back in 2001, MMS uh, issued a safety alert recommending that all of these OS, uh, OCS operators include a secondary activation system. And it's, still there is no regulation requiring that, correct? Uh, the... Um uh, th there is a there is a, re a requirement for redundancy in the MMS regulations uh, for um, uh, BOPs. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yeah. The the um, no there there's a lot of confusion about this, and, and I know that uh, Ms. Birnbaum is on your witness list. I I'd, I'd recommend that you you go through that with her. Okay. And in terms of the um, the uh, exploration plans being required to have a blowout scenario that explains how they respond, um, why have those been, in a sense, waived? Uh, the primary reason for the, uh, the, the categorical exclusion application for uh, exploration plans is that the, the only 30 days is allowed under the uh, Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Uh, so there's, there's no way to do a certainly a complete environmental analysis, and it's something the administration has requested that Congress address. Uh, so that's, that's the primary reason. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, 
in response to Congressman Heinrich's question, uh, we're doing a thorough top to bottom review of the National Environmental Policy Act's application under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. Mr. Bourne raised the difference between these deep water wells and non deep water wells. Um, is there any distinction, I, I gather there, there isn't any distinction, in the tax associated with the liability fund as it relates uh, making a distinction between deep water and non deep water? Um, you think there should be? Um, I, 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 I have not thought about that question. Okay. Um, the, one of the areas, switching to more of a local area, one of the areas they're talking about drilling is off the uh, coast of Virginia. Um, and obviously certain areas have been determined to be too environmentally sensitive. Uh, can, you, can you give me an, an idea of why the, an area that's very, very close to the Chesapeake Bay wouldn't qualify um, similarly to some of the other areas that have been determined to be too environmentally sensitive? Uh, it might. Uh, the, uh, the, the decision was to go forward with an environmental impact analysis uh, uh, to see whether a uh, lease sale should go forward. Uh, so that environmental impact analysis has not been done. Okay. There are other issues related to that specific location, as you may know, yes. related to the Navy, related to NASA. Right. Um, what kind of coordination is done when that decision is made to open up an area like that with other agencies and entities that may be affected by it? Uh, we work very closely with the Department of Defense. In fact, the Department of Defense has, has recently gone public with uh, an evaluation of uh, expressing concern about most of that proposed lease sale area as being needed for training purposes. I know, but why, why not do that before making the, the decision to explore opening that up? Again, the decision is contingent upon uh, bringing in all sorts of evidence. Uh, the, the next step would be a scoping process, particularly to get this kind of information. Uh, the, the Virginia lease sale was, was put on the existing five-year plan by the previous administration. It's okay. something we had that was already presented to us. Thank you. Are you back? Gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Plum. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Secretary, I, I, in all fairness, I should probably preface my questions by saying that uh, I personally was very disappointed in the administration's decision to expand uh, leasing um, to the Atlantic and, you know, beyond what had been the uh, area prior to when we had a moratorium in Congress. And I've been here 20 years. Most of the time we had presidents who, but through executive order or through the appropriations process that they supported a moratorium on any expanded leasing. And I was very disappointed to see that this administration, um, you know, broke that and started expanding the leasing to include parts of the Atlantic and other areas uh, that were deep water. And I suspected that uh, we would have another spill, catastrophic spill like this, because you're going in the deep water where there's the technology is not there to prevent a spill or to cap a spill after it occurs. And my hope is that, that the administration has learned its lesson after this and would go back um, to the moratorium we had before. You know, either the president issues an executive order uh, that had been in effect under Bush and Clinton and others, or we, uh, you know, adopt through the interior appropriations process another moratorium as we've had in the past. Um, it, I guess my questions relate to that. It, I haven't seen any indication that the president is willing to ch change his position. In other words, he, he's saying he's setting up this commission, there's going to be investigation, but on several occasions since this bill, he's made it quite clear, I think, that his intention is when this is over and when the so-called technology uh, is available, that we will now you know, expand, and, and, and he's not reconsidering. Can I just ask you three questions relative to that, though? Is there any reason to believe that the president's willing to sign an executive order that would prohibit um, any further lease sales, EISs, or explorations in areas that are now open to leasing, similar to what was in effect under the first Bush, Clinton, and most of the time under, under uh, the second President Bush? Any reason to believe that he would sign that executive order? I, I certainly can't speak to that, uh, Congressman. Uh, the President is focused entirely, as are we, on dealing with the current unfolding crisis. Uh, is there any reason to believe that he would support a um, legislative moratorium in the Interior Appropriations Bill similar to what we had for 20 years? Uh, 
I can't speak to that at this okay. point. We are focused on the unfolding disaster. That's is, where uh, attention is. mineral management in any way considering um, uh, revisiting the five-year uh, plan, which continues to open up the Atlantic coast and, and other potentially environmental and economic devastation areas? And is there any suggestion that they would reconsider the decision to expand pursuant to your five-year plan? That decision is, uh, was a draft. Uh, uh, there is no new five-year plan yet in effect. It will not go into effect until 2012. Uh, the decision that was made was to begin an evaluation of potential additions to the outer is there any uh, decision is there any suggestion that that might be reconsidered in light of uh, this spill we are putting all of our attention on the spill right now okay. congressman and um, what about the um, so I mean I, I take it since you're not responding I should assume that there really aren't any changes that are being suggested. I, I don't think that's fair to make any assumption based on my response. Okay, well I would just ask again that all those things be reconsidered. I mean, I, I listened to the Secretary's remarks and he was sort of trying to separate himself from the previous policies of mineral management, but it seems to me that in many ways you're continuing them. In other words, as long as we say that we're going to continue opening up these areas, uh, to more leasing, to more exploration, to more EISs. Um, you know, that essentially continues the policy and, and of uh, the previous administration. And, and that's very disappointing to me. I'll just make a comment here that uh, I, I think, um, uh, as the Secretary pointed out, uh, the, the approach that uh, we have taken uh, is a very cautious approach. Uh, we. Uh, were asked, were required by a court action to uh, re-review uh, decisions that the prior administration had made, been made, had made in the Arctic with, with regard to oil and gas leasing. Uh, as a result of that uh, opportunity, we canceled five lease sales uh, scheduled for the Chukchi uh, and the Beaufort Sea. Uh, we canceled lease sales associated with Bristol Bay, and in fact, the President withdrew Bristol Bay by presidential proclamation under the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. We're, our approach here has been and will continue to be a prudent approach. Well, I would just ask that you revisit the approach. We don't really want to see any drilling in the Atlantic, and we think this oil spill shows that it can't be done uh, without a catastrophic spill. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen's time expired. General Layton, California, Mr. Napolitano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Hayes, uh, Secretary Hayes, how are you, sir? Uh, I have several questions, and I, I will rattle them off because I may not have time to get them all answered at the same time. But um, I, I've been, this is the second hearing that I've attended. Uh, one was in transportation in regard to the spill. And there's still some of the questions uh, that uh, remain are oh, how many deep wells does British BP have? And how many do other oil companies have in, in, in the same um, d depth as this particular one? Uh, and does any other company have uh, the same record or, uh, uh, I would say, the wanton disregard for the government regulations and the worker safety? Because um, this is not only uh, hurting our, our country, it's also giving the industry a bad name. Uh, the uh, One of the... Uh, recommendations that's come to my attention is that maybe we might uh, have uh, Congress pass a bill to force uh, BP to divest all of its U.S. interest, uh, which would send a strong message to all the other companies that are considering uh, trying to get away with that kind of, a, uh, um, of action. Uh, secondly, do we have adequate baseline inter information uh, or maps of the shorelines, the barrier islands, and the wetlands? to be able to quantify the impact the oil spill is having on these valuable resources. If not, maybe, or I know you're utilizing resources from the Bureau and USGS to gather information so they can accurately assess uh, the damages that uh, uh, BP can be held accountable for. And referring to the Exxon uh, Valdez, uh, that was 41 years ago, I believe, and they're still having impacts. Um, I know BP professes, at least in the last hearing, that they will be responsible for paying any and all claims. Well, that may be well and good, but uh, can they replace lives? How about those people that were killed? Uh, what about, um, and the third issue is, 
mental health services that some of the uh, families and some of the people that are being affected by the spill in that whole area will have need of because there were some suicides, if I remember correctly, out of some of the other uh, uh, accidents that, that happened. Uh, and then are you considering any guidelines, uh, addition to your guidelines for employees um, in entering a, such a, um, a statement as to uh, there will be federal prosecution for those that have been playing patsy with uh, the industries. Uh, and uh, my understanding, of course, is that we also have that same kind of issue with uh, water. Now you can reply. Thank you, uh, Congresswoman. Um, and it's a pleasure to work with you on water issues. Uh, this is a different kind of water issue than we've been working on. Um, uh, just to take your questions in order, um, uh, I will defer to Liz Birnbaum in terms of the BP uh, wells, uh, in terms of the numbers. I will, I will say that there are, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, uh, 1,988 deep water wells currently and 35,000 shallow water wells. Uh, so this is a uh, this is a you know there's a there's been a significant amount of drilling activity here over the last several years. Um, in terms of your second question, um, do we have good maps? Are we doing a careful job of of evaluating the potential impacts on coastal resources? Uh, that's actually been a very important uh, initiative we've had in the in the in the recent weeks. Uh, we have had National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, a BLM, and other uh, NOAA, EPA folks, but particularly our resource agency folks, doing as coastal assessments uh, and baseline analysis before the oil hits so that we'll be able to quantify the damage. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the fact that the spill stayed offshore for the first couple of weeks provide us with that opportunity to do that. Okay, uh, Mr. Mr. Hayes, before you go on, you did not fully answer the first question because I was asking the number of BP wells, deep See yes, else. and I'll have to defer to okay. uh, the, the director of MMS. I do not know the answer to that, uh, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, 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 in terms of, of uh, mental health uh, assistance, I uh, assume that that is available and it should be available, uh, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll be happy to pass along uh, that concern to Thad Allen, who runs the uh, National Incident Command. Um, uh, and finally, uh, are, have we uh, 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 provided guidelines to employees, made it clear that, that employees who uh, 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 have ethical issues will be prosecuted? Uh, the answer is yes. In fact, uh, uh, just yesterday morning, in connection with the release of the Inspector General's report, the Secretary made clear uh, that if there were violations uh, of, of ethical concerns, folks would be fired, prosecuted, whatever was appropriate. And in fact, he immediately put the individuals identified in, in the Inspector General's report on administrative leave precisely for that purpose. That follows up on the same approach that he took uh, uh, upon coming into office in January 2009 in connection with the Lakewood, Colorado concerns that had been raised by the Inspector General. Right, but, but I just want to be sure that and not only in this particular agency, but all the other agencies in the Department of Interior. Yes. Simply because this could happen again and it's probable. Uh, bureaucracy maintains. Right. And unless we take steps to ensure that they are aware, that they are dilly-dallying, that they all will be here responsible to the full extent of the law. Yes, um, we, we, have, we have really worked hard uh, to promote uh, a, a new sensitivity to ethics in the department. It's one of the Secretary's highest priorities, uh, and we will remain vigilant throughout the department, uh, Congresswoman, uh, not just at MMS. Well, thank you very much, and you've been a great pleasure to work with, sir. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Secretary. We understand you have a meeting at the White House in 20 minutes, so we will uh, allow you to leave at this point. Thank you very much. From <laughs> appreciate the chance to uh, be with you, and I'm impressed with uh, your ability to avoid lunch and bathroom breaks, and uh, uh, and and your commitment to public service in all that regard. I'm the only one that's been able to last, uh, Mr. Deputy Secretary. I join with many of my colleagues that have already expressed deep appreciation to you for the tremendous number of hours that you've spent on this tragedy. Uh, Tremendous sacrifice to yourself, to your family, and uh, 
We really appreciate it. Thank you for your service. Our next uh, witness is Ms. Marielle Kendall. 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 Kendall, sorry. The Acting Inspector General, U.S. Department of the Interior. <laughs> 